Ladies and gentlemen, we are officially live. Welcome to the Fourth Watch Bible Study. Ask not what Almighty God can do for you. Ask not what you can do for your country. Now the trumpet summons us again, where the strong are summoned to give service, summoned to bear arms. All this will be getting the final success of failure, asking his blessing. And let us never fear the command to undo the heavy burden and let the oppressed go free. Let us begin. Always gets me in the feels every time. All right, we are the guys. Welcome to the Bible study. Introductions aside. Um, our names don't matter, but this is going to be a fun one, a really fun one. So I'm going to go ahead and finish. I won't say finish, but I'm going to dive in kind of where I was headed on Monday night during the men's gathering in Fullerton. Um, not the whole way, because there's some some other things I want to touch on. But long story short, what if people of God took the word of God seriously and followed Jesus's lead and desired to be the remnant of over being raptured out of here what if what if we actually chose adventure over rapture what if the possibility is even there to to not only choose but to lead a lifestyle and even a generational lifestyle that actually impresses upon us and the entirety of our community our family everyone that we're not just going to go through the typical motions we're actually going to engage the word of god and the kingdom of god on earth as it is in heaven if we're praying that way, what if we actually lived that way? What if that was just a thread that that wove our entire existence together? And and the predominant aspect of this I want to impress upon you guys is Romans eight nineteen, and it's something that it's something that I I, I need you to to take full hand, you know, full heart, everything. <clears throat> it's that creation eagerly waits for the arrival of the sons of God. It's not angels. It's people. It's God-fearing, Holy Spirit-filled people. And again, if, 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 if we, let's say that we are part of creation, if we don't worship God, the rocks will cry out and praise God. We have to be ready for the fact that if we understand this, oh, what's up? Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's on. Even head. All right, we've got guys online. If we have an opportunity, we get to lead our entire families on a footing that completely changes the paradigm of what it is to live for God on earth, what it is that our assignments are. And we get to weave this thread throughout the fabric of ourselves, our homes, our community, at the dinner table, at, you know, at the conference table. And all of a sudden, people look at us like, oh my gosh, you guys are actually unfazed by what's happening. Absolutely. freaking we have, we have no care for what the world is going to do because God is with us in it until he's not until we're actually called to go somewhere else. And this is the part that, that kills me. Listen, I'm going to give this caveat until I'm blue in the face. I'm not here to crap on churches. I believe everyone should go to church. I believe that the spirit of God that's in you should actually invade those walls if the spirit is off in the church. I believe that all pastors, I hope to God they're hearing from the Holy Spirit. I don't think everyone's getting it 100% right. I don't get it 100% right. But at the very least, if the Holy Spirit's in you, is driving you, pressing you, then you need to go in and actually affect the atmosphere of the church. If the church is sick, weak, and asleep, right? Second Corinthians 11, I think it is, it's second or first, right? Where it talks about how when you take communion together, if someone comes with the right, wrong heart posture, your, your spiritual heart posture needs to be something that affects the atmosphere. And people walk up to you like, hey, bro, what's going on? What, uh, what are you about? What do you believe? What's what's going on with you? And you get to say, like, everything's great, man. He's like, really? Because this is all going sideways. I've had this conversation too many times. People have a heaviness that Daniel 7 cogitations of the heart where they know something's wrong. They know something's going on. And what, what are they doing? They're looking for someone that's operating on a different footing. And then we come across Romans 8, 19. All of creation is waiting for the, for the, for the sons of God to appear. The question then is, what is our heart posture? Do we even want to be sons of God? Do we even want to desire remnant over rapture? And what's the only thing that's really standing in the way? I hate to say it, 
It's the modern American Christian church. And I'm going to go as far as to say this. Several churches right now are part-time, low-key, rapture cults. They are so drunk on the message and the meaning and the posture of, the, of we're getting raptured out of here, folks. Don't worry about it. It's coming. We're going to focus our message on the rapture. We're going to talk about it. We're going to justify our statement and our cause. And we're going to get you to just be ready for the rapture. Unfortunately, they're not giving the caveat that half the room will not have oil in the lamp, will not be raptured out when everyone else is. I'm not saying there's not a rapture. I'm saying that rapture happens on God's timing whenever he chooses. And you can say, oh, but the Bible says this, 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 and that. That's fine. But guess what? Human timing and God's timing are still not simpatico, right? It's a little bit off. So what if we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves thinking that we're going to have the timing nailed down and all the signs and wonders are nailed down? The reality is we might get it wrong. Bigger reality is that the pastors might get it wrong. And so this conversation isn't to say don't go to church. Don't believe your pastor. Your pastor's wrong. Conversation is saying it's time to exchange rapture for remnant. Rapture for adventure. We serve the God of adventure, or we don't. That choice is literally yours. Do you serve a God of worry? How many Christians out there are afraid of what's coming? How many Christians out there are actually thinking September 23rd is, is something to be concerned about or worried about? It's not. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever God chooses to do is going to happen, right? Things won't happen until the man of lawlessness is revealed, which we know is the Antichrist. Hasn't happened yet. We might say, oh, it's this person, it's that person. Still hasn't happened yet. I think everyone's spirit, their, their gut is saying like, okay, there's still some things that need to unfold first. And so until then, how about we not worry about what's coming and we start engaging what's here and then be on a posture on our feet instead of on our knees of what's coming. Because when it comes, trust me, I don't care who you are, it's going to catch you somewhat off guard. You might ha not have enough food, guns, ammo, toilet paper. It doesn't matter. People survive for hundreds of years without these things. Thousands of years, not hundreds, thousands. I'm saying this because I'm, my concern is that our priorities are not aligned with the Holy Spirit's heart and reason for bringing us to the edge of eternity on the greatest rescue mission a yard from hell. And so this conversation is going to be something where we're going to keep it kind of looser than most. But like, I want us to hash out the different perspectives that, that some people that are watching might have. And I, I said some stuff in the videos I posted today, and it wasn't again. I'm not. I'm not trying to, you know, splash cold water in people's faces. It's like, listen, this is a choice. Faith in Jesus Christ is a choice. Being filled with the Holy Spirit for spiritual gifts is a choice. Being filled with the the best spiritual gifts, which is the gift you need in the moment, is a choice. It's a matter of zealousness. Paul even said, "Be zealous for spiritual gifts." So all these things, we realize we have the choice, which means we have the honor of stepping in and desiring to be remnant over rapture. That means everything changes. Our perspective changes all the way down to a words, right? That it's the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we need to be speaking remnant. We need to be thinking remnant. We need to be training remnant. We need to be guiding remnant and, and lifting up others and encouraging remnant and speaking life and life more abundantly. And it's, it might very well go against the narrative of the church that you go to where the church is pushing for rapture over remnant. And that's fine. You don't need your pastor's permission to want to be here when, you know, when everything's falling apart and God's church is coming together. And even to want to be here all the way until Christ returns, because we already know there's Christians here for a thousand years. And listen, there's a bunch of conjecture, a bunch of scriptures saying this, that, the other. Listen, I, I don't I don't have I'm not the guy that looks for crowns. People are like, oh, it's the crown of life. It's the crown. I don't care. Like, look, save the rewards. God alone is the one that assigns the rewards. God alone is the one that says, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm striving for that. I'm striving for spiritual excellence, knowing I'll never attain it in this life. But God is going to find me striving until the day I die. And that's thankfully I'm surrounded by a bunch of dudes like you who aren't going to let me drop the ball or at least are, are going to give me a hard time if I do, because you guys are all good like that. I'm curious how people even come to the conclusion that what, there will be a pre-tribulation rapture. When I read Matthew 24, I see Jesus speaking, red letters, chain of events, and then, and then, and then, and then. And, and what's at the end of it? You know, your, your rapture, if you want to call it that, right? So <clears throat> I'm, I'm confused where people even get it. Well, well I, think, uh, I was going to say, 
I was gonna say, how many people do you know buy lottery tickets? <laughs> yeah, there's no contingency plan. Like they they uh they've got all their eggs in one basket, and it's like that. You're just asking to be disappointed uh, because there's no, like you said, it's a lottery. I mean, there's no contingency plan. People at least need to have a contingency plan. So in case it doesn't happen, because, uh, you know, we talked about the, the great falling away and uh, you know, I've, I've heard people say that's already happened. Like it just, it's, ha it's happened over time. Uh, but then I've heard others say that it hasn't necessarily happened yet. Uh, I mean, statistically, you know, the United States used to be like 90% Christian. Now it's down to 60%, but I'd say that it's even lower than that because those are just people, everyone who claims to be a Christian. So the great falling away could have potentially happened, but I don't know. Well, it's also, it's going to happen in, in degrees. And so what we've seen happen already, it's going to happen even greater than what we've seen. That's really what that means. So can, you imagine, can you imagine even more people going to fall away? Even more. Especially if they're putting all their eggs in one basket for it to be pre-trib, and then they're going to be disappointed when it doesn't I, happen. I, I'm reading Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sh sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from, uh, from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and then they shall see the coming of the Son of Man, and he shall send his angels with a great sound, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds. I mean, if that's not a chronological series of events, I don't know what is. So, yeah, I've always been one to plan for the worst, hope for the best, especially on this stuff. And I'm with you, Steve. I'd rather face it, right? I'd rather leave my mark on this planet for God's kingdom uh, in despite uh, facing all, all uh, the worse the odds, the better. And if we're if we're talking about remnant and exactly what the Bible says, we already covered it, right? The remnant will be known for their ways and their doings. Explodes. Like as 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 Ezekiel fourteen is this passage that we broke down about. Okay, so not only are people judged, but nations are judged for under their unfaithfulness. And so the curse of Jeremiah sixteen that's tied to Malachi four of fatherlessness and how your fathers went wayward and how the, the next generation does even worse than their fathers. Okay, so God sends the sword, famine, plagues, you know, pestilence onto nations that go completely down a godless path. But it, it says even if these three people, like these three like great figures, right? I think it's like Moses, Daniel, and Job or something like that. I forget, remember which one it was. Even if they were here, God would save them, but he wouldn't save, but he wouldn't save their children. And then it goes on to this thing. It says, like, but don't worry. I'm going to make sure that your children, which he refers to as the remnant, your sons and daughters will be the remnant, and they'll be known by the ways and their doings, which means we have the great honor of establishing our ways and doings on the word of God and then going forward and be like, all right, God, here we are. We're going to have this conversation. And through the course of reading the Bible and brushing up with other people and reinforcing ourselves, our home, our communities, we then become a people worthy of a king's return. Because look at look at it like this. So if Jesus returns to a, a blameless and spotless bride, a beautiful bride, is that a bunch of people that just want to be raptured out? No. Or otherwise, why would he even come back to them? It's people who are here on purpose, sent under authority, that uh, completely understand their identity. And they're not trying to say like, hey, we just want to haul pass out. We want to be comfortable. Hey, even though Jesus died on the cross for us, we don't really want to get into too much trouble. We don't want to be persecuted. This whole online persecution is kind of a little bit much. So we don't want that. That's not what Jesus is returning back to. Like I'm looking at, I'm looking at who Jesus was, the man of Christ. And how does it, how do we even think that somehow people that desire a rapture more than they desire a remnant? How do they think that they're going to be told, well done, good and faithful servant? It baffles me. Yet most people do. A ton of people do. If that I, makes sense. I constantly sense. hear people just leaning on, you know, the, the infinite grace of Christ rather than the accountability of the individual to actually live accordingly. Totally. And what's, what's, what's funny, too, like, Heads, Heads also brought it up, right? He feels like the word endurance gets tossed around far more than practiced. <laughs> How else do you endure? 
and again, the, the only place I can really see in a measure of endurance is what Abigail said to David. For God has made for David an enduring house because David fights the enemies of God. If, you're, if that's how you endure because you're fighting the enemies of God, you can't fight the enemies if you're raptured out of here. So even from an endurance perspective, anyways, I, like you guys get what I'm saying, but like what, what, what have you guys found are the meritable, maybe not even meritable, are just the arguments or suggestions like why people think that they should be raptured out versus want to be here for remnant, or maybe they haven't even come up across that conversation yet. Well, I mean, not to back too far, but do you think that most people even know who God's enemies are? No. No. All right, do we, do we need not. to go through that? They know who they're in. Yeah, I think it's worth naming a couple. Look at the book of Revelation outlines it over and over. One of the things it mentions is a liar. And what does 1 John 2.22 tell us? Who is a liar but he who denies Christ, right? So first of all, the enemies of God are Christ deniers. And then it goes on in Revelation in particular, right? Talking about, and I'm just spitballing here. I, that's a book I should probably go word for word from, but um, who else is getting called out? Idolaters, you know, those who, uh, fornicators. And I think that's really referring to like sex magic, black magic, all that kind of wacky stuff that we know that there's certain cabals practicing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go a step further, right? Daniel 9. And this ties into what we're talking about, right? And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Okay. So when we're talking about people, the prince to come, who's the prince that comes to mind? Christ. The, the prince of the power of the air. Oh, so this is oh talking sorry. About, That's the darkness. This, this, is, this is talking about the bad people that, that destroy the sanctuary and just go on a rampage. So when, when you look at it, you're like, it's the people, the prince to come, which means, and when you put it into prophetic context of Daniel 9, it puts it in context of Satan being called the, the prince of the power of the air. I believe, and I still stand by this, this is a prophetic title. This actually wasn't a title that was given to him at the time that he was rolling around doing his thing. I think it's something that we have now with the Holy Spirit's understanding and unction. That's how we identify who he is. It's even how we identify the season that we're in is because the airways, literally the, the air is, it's set to steal, kill, and destroy. Like look at the radiation that's in the air that really got kicked up during the Spanish flu time of 1918. And then all of a sudden look at what's proliferating all over the, the quote unquote airways, the internet. It's depravity of every kind. And you can't tell me that that's not Satan in, in full bloom. I, I just, I don't see it. And so I, I say that because if we know that the people of the prince to come, and then then Second Samuel 23, I keep going back to that, verse 6 and 7, says the sons of rebellion. And it says that Satan has children. We have to somehow not disconnect or disassociate, but at least put within the frame of mind that true, the New, the New Testament says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we wrestle, we strive against powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness, all these things. The spiritual side, the host of wickedness, we strive and wrestle against that. But we're also told that when the sons of rebellion rise, we will not lay hands on them. Instead, we'll use tools of iron, the shaft of a spear, and we'll utterly cut them down with fire. Until then, we're supposed to speak to people, try, try and reach out to them and convey the love of God to them in a way that's relevant, acceptable, approachable, isn't arrogant, isn't like asking more of us. But in order to do that, we have to identify the fact that, yes, there are people working for the other team. There are people who the word of God says, we will be cutting down the tools of iron, the shaft of a spear, and fire. I, I, this is why I, I think I even posted up something on the social media stuff. This, this whole ministry, like what we do and what we talk about, we're not trying to be something that everyone gleans from or gets something from. This is for the remnant. These are for the people that, that already at least have a sense that they're, not gonna, that they're still going to be here, or at least people that don't want to be raptured out and they want a dog in the fight or they're trying to reconcile what it is that they're, they're dealing with. It's the 1% that are going to get our hands dirty. And of that, you know, 99%, the whole 100% is from the loving hands and feet of Christ. 
But the 1% that's going to get their hands dirty, we need to have the framework of what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, and the king that we're serving. That's All these messages are geared towards that. So anyone that's watching saying like, you guys are crazy. What do you mean? It's a rapture cult. That's exactly what it is. If you have a ministry, if you're going to a church that's so predominantly focused on rapture and not speaking to you at all, that you might in fact be here, not just through hard times, but even until Christ returns. At the very least, be prepared for everything. That way you're one of those people up in heaven that's crying out and yelling out for judgment, for God to actually judge the wicked because you endured hardship and you died as a result of it. And then this is this is something that I was getting at too on Monday and never got to. So you know how Psalm 91, everyone's like, oh my gosh, I love it. So, so we plead that over our sons and our daughters and we plead that for safety and protection. Verse 13. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the dragon. And then Jesus says, you'll know my followers, speak in other tongues, cast out devils, raise the dead, heal the sick, drink poison and handle snakes and not die. Well, don't get me on a rampage, especially those with you guys. Apostles, right? It's, it's not. Those, those are Christ followers, not, not, not it's apostles. Not just apostles? Nope. It says Christ followers. Christ said, you will know my followers. They were speaking other tongues, cast out devils, heal the sick, uh, lay hands, heal the sick, raise the dead, and then drink poison and handle snakes, not die. It's, me it's mentioned in two. Until the day you're called. But but think about it. why would it say handle snakes and not die? Not because you're one of those crazy people in the Arizona desert that like have like the rattlesnake pick in your in your church, because that's <laughs> have you seen you guys have seen that, right? Yeah, it's whack. Southern Baptist, isn't it? <laughs> I, you know, I think you get different brands of people doing this stuff. You know, you get your whiskey drinking hillbilly crowd. I th I, that's how I always pictured like Appalachian, you know, dare I say, inbred churches or something, God forbid. Yeah, that's not always how it has occurred to me. Just out there. I Okay, so first and foremost... I'm not mad if you have a little bit of drink and go to church. At least you're in the house of God. Okay, so let's just get that out of the way with. But as soon as you cross the line of intentionally handling snakes, uh, I, I don't know, you're, you're pushing it. But what I'm saying is when when, Rev when Psalm 91 says that we will trample, you know, the, the lion and the cobra, young lion and the dragon, he's already telling us that like the spiritual snakes, even up to like what happens if we do have these crazy hybrids and they some random angel happens to have – relations with a snake or they produce something that creates these like monster snakes it means they're fair game it means god's already given us the words the weapons and the tools to go against these things and then as time goes forward the holy spirit's presence increases in our lives our active daily life is what i'm here's what i'm getting at the only reason why the word of god would tell us these things is because they've happened they are happening and they're going to happen at an even greater scale. That is the only reason why the Word of God wastes nothing. There is nothing erroneous what? about the Word of God. There's nothing extra or baked in, which means if we haven't experienced these things yet, if we desire to be remnant over rapture, there's a pretty fair to midland chance we're going to somehow come you know, face to face with at least the need to exercise these gifts on a greater scale. It's a question. The, I mean, I, I think I can see the obvious benefit to the what, what the rapture is or what the concept of the rapture is, right? Um, but I guess two questions. Do, do you avoid judgment? Um, because I feel like everybody still has to go through judgment for what they did in their life. So even if you get raptured, and I guess that's a, the second question is, what would qualify you to be somebody that should be raptured? Is that included? I mean, it's a fair question. So first so, and foremost, no, no, nobody escapes judgment, though. But, but I mean, there's only one example. And I don't know if they ever escaped judgment. I don't really know what happened, but we got Elijah, right? So you got one, Enoch. one example. Enoch. Of all, or Mary. Right. Well, it's Elijah. Not, but Kidding. You've got those two examples. <laughs> How many believers do you have? I mean, you have millions of people. So, I mean, there's not a whole lot of precedent that's been set to rapture people. Um, so I'm just kind of looking for some parameters. Maybe people can give themselves 
because obedience to the word and things like that, you know, you can, you can be as obedient as a guy like Abraham that's ready to kill his own son, or you can be obedient where you're going to church every Sunday. So I don't know. I think it, it really just depends on what your barometer of faith is to get you where you're even worthy of being somebody that's. Well, I mean, it's, it's between you and God. I mean, that's nobody can really tell you, right? I mean, right. Well, that's, I think that kind of speaks to the question of what the pastors are saying. What, what, what are they? Uh, yeah. What are they even Can they clarify and, uh, their point? Well, and honestly, they're yeah. not doing that because they're speaking at scale but, to a congregation without giving an individual, you know, synopsis. And but, but here's the thing: it's not on the pastors. And I, I'm going to say this, and it's it's going to be. Well, what is I don't, the, what I don't, is the cult don't, offer? What is the cult offering? If you want to put it that way, I don't. The cult. The, the cult. The cult is offering what people want to hear. Right. The cold, the cold, the, the reason why the pastors are right. saying that is because the people want the easy way out. That's just human do, nature. Do people feel like they're going to avoid judgment. Is that what that means? No, people feel they like if they're, rapt they're if they're raptured, if they're raptured, they've, they've, they're on the swim lane that they've been judged and proved worthy of being raptured out. Right. That okay. that's, that's the actual understanding is that like, oh, if I got raptured, I must be on the good side. And then all of a sudden, here's here's the sense I get. If God said, you know, whom can, whom can we send? And, and Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Again, there's a possibility that two are in the field, one is taken, one is left, that the one that's left in the field is the A team, and the B team got, got removed off the playing field because God knew what's coming. They're not going to be strong enough to go through it. I'm not saying I'm, this is the gospel according to Steve, right? There's there's a line that you have to work out how you feel it's gonna it's gonna play out, but how is it on any sensible mind or framework, military strategy? And Phil saying this, right? It's no different in any war. People always self declare themselves warriors until it's time to step in. Amen. Absolutely. And Eddie's saying like Joel chapter two, it totally describes army. I love that chapter about this. But what I'm getting at is the self declaration of in the self idea of I get raptured, I'm worthy to be raptured. Therefore I'm going to be told well done, good and faithful servant. I don't think applies, but people wanted to. I think we can also well, blame I, uh, the, the left behind movie. Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. I, 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 uh, the way, the way that I always thought is uh, that you were, you know whether whether you would have died in the moment anyway, like if you if you were saved, then you would be like for 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 sure, like you would you would be raptured, and anybody else who wasn't would be left. But then again, that's right? basically what those movies said as well. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily answer his questions like who is saved because that's between every man and and, and God. But uh, that's one thing that I love about the the church that I've I started going to. I think it was you know, about. Two months ago, we started going to this new church, and I was like, okay, I'll go try it out. I actually watched it online a few times, and, man, the guy just knocks it out of the park every time. And I'm like, I've never been to a church where a guy just, like, he speaks truth like this. And people love it. People, It's growing. The, the, the church is growing, and I'm like, oh, man. Like, I've never, like, sat through a sermon and been like, yes. But this guy makes me makes me say that, and I, I, I respond that way to, to his preaching. But – he talked about it this last Sunday where he said most churches are focused on getting declarations rather than turning people into disciples. And that's where we've gone wrong is we got people that raise their hand in church and say, oh, you know, please accept Jesus in, into your heart. Read Romans. Uh, I forgot the exact verse, but uh, say that and say if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is, is Lord and you believe that in your heart, then then you will be saved, and then they're done. And it's like, no, nah, we need to be creating disciples. And that's what my pastor said, and I was like, you're absolutely right. Thank you for saying it, because other pastors are scared to. And uh, that's that's the that's the problem is uh, people people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear it. Well, and I I, I want to bring up what what Gummo commented on. He basically said that people don't read the Bible and do the deep dive and spend the time to actually like hash these things out. And so we do. We're those annoying Christians that actually take the word of God seriously, spend time in it, and don't just wait for someone else to tell us what we're supposed to hear, especially Eddie. If you guys don't know Eddie's spray, is it Sprayberry? Yeah, Sprayberry. Dude, the dude's on, dude's on fire. The guy's all over the place on, on TikTok. Every time I see his stuff, 
He's warning people because he spent time in the Word and he's spending time in the presence of God. And if you don't do if you don't do those things, you're not going to know what side of the fence you're going to sit on anything. And then what you might realize is that God's speaking to you so openly and clearly that God wants you to consider that His ways are above your ways, that His remnant and the possibility of it is above you wanting just to be raptured out. It changes everything. But if you don't allow it to change your heart, if you don't let the Word of God and time, like quiet alone time with God, where you're actually doing more listening than talking, if you don't spend unhurried time in the Word of God, just flipping through the pages and saying, God, what are you trying to say to me? Where are we good? Let's just do a health check. If you don't do that, you don't know what God's saying. That should terrify you. Because someone else then is telling you what your doctrine is. And your doctrine is literally... It's, it's the framework by which you exist with God. Don't ever let someone tell you how that's going to play out, ever. If you have and, and you do, repent, and then all of a sudden open up that word, dive in, and pray to God. Like You need to do everything you can to seek his face and seek his voice. Diligently seek him. Ask, it will be answered. Knock, seek, find, and then find ways of, of curating that time with God and that presence of God. Because if you don't, what are you really after? Like, who who are you really down deep in your heart? Like, do I really understand what's happening while I'm doing this? Do I understand what, what I believe and what I want, right? The heart is desperately wicked. And from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I don't want to repeat this stuff. Yeah, and uh, I guess for anybody who's listening, who's kind of new to the faith, uh, you don't have to, there's no standard that you have to meet when it comes to reading the Bible. I mean, you just read a, a passage, uh, you, you don't have to read for an hour every night. Read for 10 minutes. You know, read for five. It doesn't matter. Five minutes. Just just read it. Uh, dedicate at least a little bit of time to reading it every day. And, you know, you may not be excited about reading it. That's the same with going to the gym. You're not going to be excited about it at first. You know, it sucks. You're, you're going to have to continue going. But eventually you're going to get to a point where you can't imagine not going. You can't imagine not reading it. And, uh then you'll 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 kind of get an itch when, when you haven't gone in a little while you'll kind of get an itch to, to go back and, and and get more uh so uh that just will help you get into a rhythm and it'll help your faith grow and so the the whole idea of a rapture cult is where not only is your pastor conveying a predominant rapture based message everyone in the audience loves it regurgitates it is looking forward to it post comments on it rebukes other people for saying anything outside the framework that they understand the rapture is going to apply and how it applies to them without realizing there will be a rapture event. Not everyone that professes to be a Christian will be raptured. Like how, how much of the fire hose do you need? Part of me even wonders this. What if people are low key terrified that they could potentially not be within that group Okay, so so hear me out. They're terrified. And so they have to verbally almost like this, like self-deception, right? Matthew 24, Jesus said, be careful. Many will be deceived. What if self-deception is at the top of that list because they are asserting that they've done everything right? Kind of like these self-righteous, self-proclaimed Christians. They've done everything right. Check the box. They've tithed. They've given. They've done everything they could. They're the community. The, they go to the ladies events and the men's events. And all of a sudden they're saying like, you know something? I'm good. You should. I'm just going to tell you that you're good too because it's self-affirming. That is a cult. That's a cult-like mentality that all of a sudden you just keep affirming yourself over and over again. And then what happens? You don't even allow yourself, the Holy Spirit, to speak into the condition that you're in. It's apostasy. You all of a sudden have elevated yourself against the, again, the knowledge of God is that the Holy Spirit is active, alive, and well and speaking to you. He's always at work and always moving in and out. And so if you hold your belief structure above the possibility that the Holy Spirit might tell you something different than how you think, you're holding yourself above the knowledge of God. That's wild. I don't know if people look at themselves like that because, again, if their pastors are just giving you a message, you might think that just because you're in the audience that the pastor is speaking to, that the pastor is actually <laughs> referring to you and you are good to go. And that is not the case. I, it's terrifying. My heart breaks for those people. But at the same time, all of us experience this. Some people get high on their own spiritual supply 
that they're like, oh, I'm definitely, I'm out, I'm out, I'm going to see you. Like, like if you don't go, it means you know you're not saved. It means that you know you're wrong somehow. I just, I, I would love to just give people the chance of breaking free from what could be potentially strong delusion because you have tickling ears, and there might be a lot of people out there who are one foot on the rapture and one foot on remnant. And at the very least, if you are prepared with a heart posture that aims for a remnant, praise God that you're raptured out. Praise God that, you know, Isaiah 51, God knew that there's more evil coming and he wants to save you from it. But don't be so dead set on, on rapture. And what if it just doesn't, what if you get harpazoed and it doesn't meet the criteria, the qualifications that you think a rapture might occur? At that point, I just, I foresee people stumbling greatly and being jarred in their faith. And if your faith is on display for other people, or other people are standing on your faith for the framework of theirs, you are going to cause people to err, which means prepare for the worst and pray for the best. So I feel like a remnant mindset is and as simplified as it is, even though it's not at all that simple. Yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, religious groups that it's become so rule based where it's, you know, it's being obedient to the rules more than being obedient to God and, and your relationship with him. And uh, you know, I'm seeing that everywhere these days. Well, that's what we talked about before we got started, right? Matthew twenty four ten, and then many shall uh, uh, shall be offended. Uh, what are they going to be offended about? Well, that they got left behind. What does it say right before that? Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. So when the persecution comes, they won't be ready for it. They've already got in their head that they're going to get out of the way, and then they're going to be left offended. And then the love of many grows cold. So this is really kind of a, a downward spiral. I think. Uh... What is it? Uh, I think that's how uh, God. He talks about separating the wheat from the chaff. Where uh, you know it's easy. It's easy to be uh, a Christian when when things are, are going well, going smoothly. But uh, like I said, separate the wheat from the chaff. How, how is he going to do that? You know, put us put us through some persecution, I guess. Well, and what's what's crazy though is. Oh, how many how many people do the self assessment where they say, "God, where am I? Let's do a health check," and then just wait for God to speak. Nobody. Well, here's what one of the things that they say is uh, to 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 justify it is uh, why would why would he want to uh, to put his bride through the, the persecution like that? You know. Uh, and, and it's like, well, I mean, it tells us in the Bible we're going to get through persecution. Like, with you, you can expect it. It's not something that you can't, that, like, you can't say, well, we didn't know. We didn't think this was going to happen. And not only that, but the uh, first generation Christians had to go through tons of persecution. You know, it doesn't guarantee not going through any type of persecution. It, it, it guarantees it more than anything. Well, and that's why the, the church tries to give stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, showing that, that, that the figure of Christ is with you in the fire. But we've, we've grown up in such a comfortable and apathetic culture within America, especially America, that even the slightest heat, we're like, oh, persecution, persecution. And it's like, nope, not at all, not at all. No, exactly. Never, never get punched in the face. You've never trained hard. You've never exerted yourself. You don't know what it is. Very few people have hit the street evangelizing. Very few people. Like, listen, i got to give something to Charlie Kirk. I've seen videos where that dude is getting yelled at and spit on by college people, losing their minds. And that guy maintains his composure under fire. Like, hats off yeah. to him. Low key, maybe there's a bunch of dudes out there who they haven't even put themselves out there to evangelize because they know they're going to murk people. Like straight up, just murk them if if something goes goes weird. But again, count it all joy. How do you have endurance? How do you how do you know what your fiber is of what you can even withstand? A lot of people don't even know. So what do we do with that? We have to put ourselves. I and I'm not saying you need to all of a sudden become you know. Don't don't be masochistic when it comes to faith, but put yourselves in places where you might brush up against some adversity. I know I'm saying this. Being my size, and and most of you know my size for frame of reference. So I understand I can I can do and say a lot of things, then most people probably won't say anything back. Most, but 
when it happens, I praise God that it does because I'm sharpened as a result of it. But that's that's my nature. I'm I'm actually one built for things that are not easy, that are difficult. My nature is born through adversity. My personality is kind of born through adversity. But because of that, it's like that's why I love people so much. And trust me, I didn't used to love people so much. But I love people enough because I love God more. And he's shown me that people are literally in bondage. And this whole rapture cult is a group of people in bondage. And listen, love me some Jack Hibbs. Love me the political pastors that stood in the gap and said, uh, we're going to push against the state because every, every right that we don't exercise, we end up losing. But to lead your entire congregation, and speaking for most of Calvary chapels, to lead your entire congregation down the path of rapture over remnant and to not even speak to people about spiritual gifts and foster them, yet you're going to mention the Holy Spirit all the time. You're going to pray for things and healing. You won't even rebuke Satan directly. You say, oh, no, the Bible said that the Lord rebuke you. Sorry, Jesus said we are people sent under authority. If you look at what the rapture cult is, it's successful. It is predominant. It is well publicized. It is well funded. And so there's no reason why you know, the rapture cult has the has the you know the the standing that it does. It's just low-key terrifying that we're having this conversation. And I don't know how many pastors are out there doing a health check with God saying, like, hey, I'm pushing this rapture thing pretty hard. Should I be pushing something else? I'd be curious to see what the percentage of people that really don't even know what 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 they're in you know they, they believe that but only because they've heard it one or two times and they really haven't dived you know dove and dug like we're deep like we were talking about earlier but yeah i bet it's a lot i think a lot of it has to do like some cost fallacy too like so many people they can't admit that they spent their lives you know based on this so might as well just finish up with the same belief even if it's wrong it's an interesting comment sorry go ahead well, I was just going to say people are we're, – we're very tribal, or at least most people are. Uh, they, uh, they, they have to have to belong to a group. It's, it's, we have, most people have like a very like us versus them mentality. And they do that with, uh, they do that with uh, ideologies these days. And so that, that, it's, it's when you get into a discussion with somebody, it more so turns to an argument because they don't want to consider that they may be wrong. They, they they dig into to their belief even more. Hey, Phil, if you're still on, by the way, be safe, man. We got a guy down on the New Mexico border that's actually just got a call that they're apprehending some people coming across. Welcome to the Fourth Watch, people. This is live action. So you guys are totally right. And th this is the interesting part. So Kevin, I need to go back to this comment. Said, I find comfort when the truth is finally known. Cool. So I was lied to for years. Copy that. Of course I was. It was, it was the man thing that's lying, not God. And that's the difference too, right? Like we have to differentiate the fact that men will tell you from the framework of what they know, what they want, what they're comfortable with, and they, they won't. And praise God, because you don't want a pastor that's going to go rogue and just give their own gospel and not something else. The rapture is in the gospel. So if they're speaking about rapture, it's biblical. But if they're trying to funnel your the entirety of your focus onto the rapture, that's where it's like, it's that's not even logical. Christ died so we could have all power, authority, and dominion. There's Christ is returning to a spotless bride, which means there are Christians here, and there will be Christians here for a thousand years. So why not speak to the other group of people that will actually still be here and have a dog in the fight? And all it might have this inner toil because you keep saying rapture, 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 and they're not getting remnant from anywhere except like fringe social media groups. Like that's doing a disservice to the body of Christ that actually might have a very different trajectory than even the pastors might, which is why partly I don't blame the pastors for what they're speaking on. It's it's disappointing. It's disheartening. I in part blame more so the people because there's more people than the pastor. And if the people want rapture and the people don't speak up, the pastor's never going to approach something differently. And I'm, listen, I'm not saying that I binge watch Hibs or like the other Calvary Chapel people like once they go sideways on the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts, and they say, you just need to have spiritual fruit. I know con men that have mimicked spiritual fruit and ripped off churches of millions of dollars, entire bank accounts, because they had the exact fruit of the Spirit on display. All that to say, like we're going through this, and we know that it's tickling ears, 
and so this this whole study becomes equally a part where pastors repent, go to God, do a health check and see what you should be speaking on, as well as congregation, repent, do a health check, and go to God and say, am I an heir by wanting the rapture more than wanting remnant? This is where we address heart posture. And if we can't address this, you know, with us men corporately and then be on display for other people to understand it, we're failing. Like, we shouldn't even have this Bible study because as far as I know, people aren't talking about this. They're not talking about the heart posture behind rapture or remnant. They're just talking about the theological disputes and differences, which, sorry, I don't want a mind that knows God. I want a heart that's after God's heart because we're never going to understand the timing, the dates, the sequence, God's God's ways are completely higher than ours. The word of God tells us that. So the farther down the rabbit holes we go thinking that we've actually got this this whole thing figured out, we're fools. We're lying to ourselves. Steve, you said something a while back, and I'm going to mess up the phrasing, but it was basically to the effect of at some point in time, your logic and faith have to part ways. And I think that that's kind of what this is, too. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin. Kevin, 1776, I just joined the police force for a month, and you understand what Steve is saying about Charlie Kirk. Yeah, that's dead on. Um, okay, so it was Blaise Pascal, the freaking mathematician, says the heart has reasons which reason can't understand. Let's apply that at a faith level. If we have hearts after God, if we are men with hearts after God's own heart, there's a point where our understanding, a reason, the faculties of our of our knowledge, of everything that we structure into that, it's going to go contrarian to where we stand within the you know big picture of, of what we understand. Because I hate to say it, you can learn the entire Bible. You guys know that there are biblical scholars that go to Bible school just for the archaeological or the historical knowledge and understanding and framework, yet they don't even follow Christ or believe that he is Lord and Savior. How can someone even be admitted to Bible college without believing that Jesus is Lord and Savior? We should take that up with the Bible colleges. Oh, that's right. They're a business, and they're trying to sell seats. So the business aspect of church, of Bible college, of all these things comes down to dollars, seats and dollars, business metrics that should never apply, which, again, is while saying I said it Monday, I'm saying it till I die. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know because – like uh, Eric Urban, I think that's his name, uh, well-known atheist scholar. I mean, like, uh, to me, I mean, he doesn't – I think what he brings to the, to the conversation is that he's wrong, and we can prove that. So I, I think they're kind of important. Just in that no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm all good with brushing up against atheists. I'm all good with having a mind against these things. But, but let me ask you something. Does every single person that goes up against them pray and listen to the Holy Spirit and heed the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, should I even be going into this fight? No. Well, if it's They're a debate. Heavy. I, well, I'm, we're not called to, to debate every single person that wants to debate us. No. Well, well I mean, what's it, when it's like a uh, like an actual event. You know where it's, oh yeah, you, you sign two, up for that. Yeah, two great minds coming together, or well, maybe one and not so much the other. But uh, <laughs> then, then it's uh, you know, then it's then it's uh, it's kind of beneficial. You learn a lot from it. So, but but no, just in everyday life with with you, don't cast your pearls before before swine. Uh, basically, what 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 atheists do is they're trying to just score virtue points from you because that voice in their head is telling them that they're wrong, that they're, that the, it's making them feel bad for the way that they're living. So they need to prove you wrong so they can shut that voice in their head up. So they just, yeah, you virtue yeah, points from you. Inwardly, yeah, inwardly they're, they're pretty much dying. And here's the other part too, yeah. is that even the smell of Christianity, the Bible tells us the smell of Christianity on us is a smell of death to them. But this, Matt, I'm, I'm getting back to this. We are not called to every single conversation or debate and and here's here's the thing that trumps everything. Childlike faith trumps your ability to debate someone on the merits, details, and facts and, and, and belief structures of Christianity. If your faith doesn't have any sense of being childlike, if you're not filled with spiritual gifts and you, you get ahead of yourself and you all of a sudden want to have the mind that goes on debating, 
I, I pray to God people pump the brakes and say, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit first to make sure that I'm hearing everything loud and clear and I don't get ahead of myself. And I'm not saying that you can't debate first and then be filled with the Spirit of God. And I'm not saying you have to have all the, the, the gifts of the Spirit as evidence. But as long as your heart posture is one that you desire the infilling of the Holy Spirit far, 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 a thousand times to one more, then you desire a mind of the Word of God and a mind of Christ. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is the only evidence of our salvation. Having a head full of knowledge, having a head full of the Word of God, having even memorized every single word that Jesus said is not greater than the Holy Spirit's infilling inside of you. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have said, it's better that I leave, that the Holy Spirit come. And so, dude, and I'm not, this isn't to come at you. It's like, it's just to remind people that the infilling of the Holy Spirit is literally a thousand to one of greater importance than having the Word of God memorized and being able to debate someone that's outside the faith. No, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that's uh, definitely an, important to uh, to establish. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that it actually hurts the atheists when you argue with them. Because, again, when we argue with people, we tend to dig into our own <laughs> side more. And, again, they're trying to score virtue points with you so just by arguing totally. with them, you're hurting them. So do not cash your totally. purses, verse one. Don't argue with them because you're doing them a disservice. You, they're, they're using you to shut that voice in their head up. You want that voice to keep talking to them so that they do come to Christ. So don't even talk to them about it. Don't even debate them. Well, and the, the other thing I would say is if you do feel led to say something, because sometimes we all feel led to say something, what if the move is to desire to have a word of knowledge and a word of prophecy for someone's life where you're able to speak into their life. A word of knowledge means you know something about them that, you know, they haven't either. They don't know or that they do know. They haven't told someone. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit gives you a little bit of secret insight. And all of a sudden, like, now it's the door open of intrigue. It's Daniel 11. People will come into faith and relationship with God because of intrigue. So what if then if you find yourself in that situation, instead of not engaging, you pray and say, like, Holy Spirit, I need something. If you if you have something if you want to convey a message across, I desire you to give me a word of knowledge and say those words specifically in the name of Jesus. I'm asking for a word of knowledge for you to fill my spirit with something that I can convey truth to this person in a way that that clearly tells them my God is real and my God is relevant and He's alive and He wants to reach you. And that's if at least we're on that footing. I would say you're absolutely right. Don't debate someone just to chop down a tree, right? Because it's an old African proverb. The tree remembers and the ax forgets. You might just move on to, to, to the next thing that you say or do. So, dude, in that sense, you're a thousand percent right. And sometimes we inadvertently chop down people like trees and we have no regard for the damage that we did. Shame on us. Like, that's something that we should totally yeah. repent for. Well, and pride. I, it's, 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 it's totally pride. It's like a little feather in our cap. And what's cool, though, is... We have the opportunity of pressing in and desiring a spiritual word from a very real and relevant spiritual God that that person has no idea even exists, or at least, or they're, or they're, they're struggling with that idea that he exists because of trauma, because someone else in the faith jacked him up. There could be all sorts of different reasons why it happened. But on our part, we get to pull out this weird angle of like, guess what? We know our God is real because he speaks to us. And he's also given something for you as well. Dude, I've, I've said some things to some people that kind of read their diary out loud. And they just looked at me like, who are you? Who, who are you? How did you know that? And it's not about my myself. In those moments, to be quite honest, I was actually surprised, but I was pleasantly surprised. Um, no, I've de I haven't had that happen to me yet, but. Definitely dude, it's wild. Happen. It's wild. No, I, I, yeah, I pray into it too. I mean, you know, ask God to create those divine appointments. If you will, if you will, man. Yeah, and so by the way, I I didn't mean to um just throw Calvary Chapel under the bus. Well, technically, Greg Laurie comes from Calvary Chapel, so listen, I spent time guarding Greg and Jonathan and the family, so I do have just a teensy amount of skin in the game. Still go to the men's gatherings when I can, but they are also a rapture cult. What if okay? So, what about this? What if the pastors are speaking to their level of desire and their level of knowledge? What does that get back to? 
people that go to church, you're the pastor six days a week. The pastor is the pastor one day a week. And so if you were just yep. drinking from the, from the fire hose, what what if all of a sudden you're you're hitching your wagon to someone that is also going to be completely blindsided by the fact that they didn't get raptured out? What happens then? What happens if your pastor that signed you up for the rapture cult doesn't get raptured and you're standing there right, right next to him on the Sunday after it happens? What does that church look like? Offended. <laughs> How many pastors have become so preoccupied with with just the nuances of running a church where it's marriage counseling and this and this and this that they, they take the easy way out when it comes to, to preaching a sermon? It's the night before, 20 minutes, what did somebody else on YouTube say? Let me do a little little reading and then, you know, the, the effort, you know, it's just probably happens a lot. Which, unfortunately, and I, I'll still say it, all of us need to go to church. Uh, all men need to say three things. I am the church. I will engage the church. I will become the church. And so until that situation reveals itself, we need to be in these communities, which means we're going to see the situation manifest and come to fold. When we do, that then begins the question, what message do we have for people? Like, there needs to be a word and a people that are out there saying, like, we tried to tell you. Many, many will be offended. Many will be confused. And the devil is going to have a field day if that ever happens. And our, our, our job is, again, if we're on display, our faith is built up like a muscle. It's on display. And people are like, okay, what do you know? That's what I'm hoping for. Not me personally, by the way. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that we're all going to be active. But you know what I mean? Like our communities, our spheres, our circles, I hope that we build them up to where we're like, hey, there's a God I wish you knew, and, and you're ready to meet him, I think. Side by side with that, if we're trying to preach the truth to the church and wake them up to some of the things that maybe have been ingrained into their head, maybe some clarification as to what's really going on with the nation of Israel is important, right? You know, I mean, certainly 144,000 real, authentic Abraham DNA Jews are going to, you wouldn't even call them Jews, Hebrews are going to come out of there, right? But who's the guys running that place? And who are the enemies that God keeps calling out in the book of Revelation? The liars. Who's the liar? But he who denies Christ. Who's the fornicator? Oh, sex magic. Who's the, you know, drinking blood and all this nonsense? I mean, my God, there's a cabal out there that goes by a certain name claiming to be something they're not. And sadly, Calvary Chapel is right there licking boots. Anytime there's a blue line, it seems like somebody's ready to lick the boot. And I say it to be funny, but it's true. <laughs> Sometimes these phrases catch me off guard. I know. I, I do that. I have that effect on people. Just roll with it. But the <clears> bottom line, you know, there is a very important thing that we need to be aware of. Okay, so the hypothetical, and I just I, I need to throw this out. So all of creation is eagerly waiting for and anticipating the revealing of the sons of God. If that scripture is true what do we tell people that want that are, are fixated on rapture without any possibility of remnant? Like, do we present that statement, that verse? And then the question, like what, what is the play? And so for people that are watching this, right? The question is, you know, faith comes by, like Eddie said, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so we're saying the word of God. And then just like Aaron said something on, on the private chat, you had to go, but you can mention Christ, but then you have to be on display. Like nothing else I'm convinced of any more than this. If, if we are known, if we as the remnant are known by our ways and our doings, that has to be ingrained in us generationally, which means our kids, just as much as we are, our kids are going to be known by our ways and our doings. And if you look at that passage, you're like, this is exactly what God intended, is for us to actually be on display while everything is falling apart. But the problem is, if, if you don't have your faith built up, you're not going to be on display. If you don't know the Word of God well, you're going to be a little uncomfortable. And we all have to remember, like, we don't serve a delicate God. All of us have spoken up out of zealotry, out of, out of eagerness, out of immaturity, and been excited about God and said the wrong thing. Thank God He's gracious and merciful, and He didn't zap us and kill us off in the exact moment that we did it. So we're still here. We're wiser, mature, hopefully older. 
and now we have we we full know fully know that our actions are going to be the one that people are reading the most. What that means is that the people that are watching this that are feeling more remnant than rapture, if there was ever time to be on display, it's now. If there's ever a word to give people, it's just that even that simple phrase, right? Desire remnant over rapture, and then give them that verse. If all of creation is waiting for this, Second Peter says that God's people will, can accelerate the coming of the day of the Lord. Our being on display makes that happen. Why? Because if we're on display, we're speaking up against the cultural decay, against the BS. We're the ones that are desiring spiritual gifts. So when God presents us with the atmosphere and the opportunity to lay hands, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, we're the ones doing that. And they're looking at us like, how do you do that? We're like, oh, easy. It's called the Holy Spirit. Not easy, but you guys get it. We need to be on a trajectory where we are on a collision course with the versions of ourself that are exactly known as Christ followers, as Christ said, as well as the timing of God where God has placed us here on the greatest rescue mission in the yard from hell. As long as we desire to be on that course and we are fervently pursuing was it like a couple days ago? I had that. Like we need to constantly be pursuing, pursuing God. We need to be pursued in that lifestyle, pursuing God to the point that he doesn't fill us with spiritual gifts. And he puts us on a collision course with a dead and dying world that needs the gifts of Christ on display at all times. So look, at, look at what's happening around us. I think we're close, really close. On a, uh, on a practical level too, I think it's, um, not being able to, uh, not being able to say the truth, not being able to, or, or actually, I'm sorry, being able to say the truth, being able to address the elephant in the room that nobody else feels comfortable enough to address. When you say it, people will say, "Oh, thank you so much for saying that." What they they can tell you don't have the fear that everybody else has. Yeah, I I, I think it just. I mean, it's pretty simple for me. It kind of boils down to emulating Jesus. And, you know, if you want to emulate him, you know, you got, you got to walk the walk, so to speak. Um, and there's no rapture included in that. It wasn't even a thought. So, you know, it's just, I think it's more of emulate that. You hit the nail on the head at the beginning, right? Just work work to emulate that. <clears throat> if you get pulled up, then, then great. If not, it, it's, 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 I mean... Uh, the way I look, I'd rather talk about the firmament. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, that, is that taboo? Oh, the firmament. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. That's a spectacular thing. It shows his handiwork. Let's talk about that. Are you, you going to talk about that? We're going to get into that too. Pastor, what, what's true? What's not true? What matters? So, I mean, I don't know. For me, it's, you know, yeah, yeah. Just, just give people the gospel. Don't give them your version of how the end times are going to be. The Great Commission. Pretty much. Yeah, I feel like too, like the word obedience. Like we all talk about it here all the time. But you know, how often do we hear it in the church? But also, how often do we hear it in the church of like being in the context of context of like not just being obedient to the word, but like to the Holy Spirit, to the voice, to you know what He's telling you to do in the moment. Like the churches don't talk about that anymore. Or even even to start with, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if it also behooves us, you know, individually to spend time praying and asking God, like, listen, we we know we're mission focused. We know we want to be over target. We know we're spending time in Your Word. And prayer and worship, all of us should be worshiping. Like all of us should be the majority of our time, you know, when we're driving, downtime, beginning of the morning, like our, our morning prayer walks have to incorporate worship. And in doing that, it's like part of our heart posture and prayer needs to be pressing in to God in prayer and saying like, God, I want to be on display with spiritual gifts. You've put me here with a heart for remnant over rapture, with a heart for adventure over rapture, with a heart after you that wants to, you know, perform exploits and wants to be known by our ways and our doings. And so part of this time has to be spent pressing to God, asking, saying like, listen, I want to be on display with your spiritual gifts, with your supernatural anointing. I want to be out there raising the dead, which means even spiritually first and then physically, first in prayer and then in person. And it, it, it behooves us 
for those of us that know that we fall on the side of remnant over rapture, and I think most of us know, but we need to be pressing into God for not just the, the gifts to be on display, but the confidence, right? The psalmist says, right, God, you are my confidence. When we start taking that seriously, it's a confidence that we are on a collision course at the moment of God's choosing. He's going to present us with both the gift that we need and the opportunity to use the gift. But it also is incumbent on us to press into God with our foreheads tightly against his, pushing in, saying, God, reveal yourself. The world is waiting for us to be revealed, which means first God has to reveal himself in this way to us. And what does God then do? God's got his men, his women. God's got his people waiting to be on display and show the world exactly what's up. And at least at that point, let's say that they hate our words. Hate our words. Hate it all. But that also means that they're going to love the outcome of us pressing into God more than they hate our words. Because they're going to be at the benefit, hopefully the receiving end of the benefit of what we have to do for God. And that's if, if we want anything, right? That the ministry has to account for the fact that we will at some point transcend us having conversations and absolutely pressing into the fact that God's going to use us in just ways that completely confound human convention. And then the world will equally be relieved <laughs> because we've been revealed and terrified. And that's also part of the sifting. So I saw a study the other day talking about end times believers potentially this guy just made the, the the point that this is a possibility that we even like elijah could call down fire from heaven as you say in supernatural acts right i mean it, it, is anything off the table i don't think so nope uh even when we were talking about harpaza i was mentioning this to my kids the other day this must have been 30 years ago i was watching i don't know what it was like 700 club or something right i'm in high school Saturday morning, whatever it was, here's, here's the show. And I rarely watched it, but it was, you know, it just came on. And this guy was talking about how, and it was his theory that in the end times, in the same way that, what was it, Philip taken away, Harpazo, yeah. um, that, that end times believers might also be able to, let's say, escape the clutches of the enemy by walking into a closet and popping out somewhere else. I mean, it sounds like Narnia, but it, again, nothing's off the table. In, in my perspective, nothing is off the table. I love Narnia. Me too. That Narnia thing was my son's comment from yesterday. He's like, yeah, they'll get Narnia out. I was like, well, you know what? Not a bad example. So, but as Aslan's ways are not our ways. Yeah, no, totally. Right. But that's, I, and I wonder, um, that's true. Leanne saying the most churches use it, treat the gospel as a fairy tale as if jesus didn't cast out actual demons no spiritual gifts taught nope. i know which which is why and this is something that i said monday and I, I tried to get it across jesus is not returning to a four-wall church like uh, you know jack hibbs greg Laurie. i'm just saying jesus is not returning to he's not going to walk in the doors of your church jesus is returning to people just so we all understand the antichrist returns through a unified church, which is not the church that Jesus returns to. Once that's clear, if, you're t if your church is teaching rapture, who knows? Maybe the whole church is taken up. Maybe God's like, I can't even use you guys. So I just gave you a hall pass. None of you get told, well done, good and faithful servant, because you're like the D team, right? You're like the expendables and like my real people are down there. But at the very least, they're out of the fight. I'm not mad at that. And, and I, I something I put in the video too, which I need to get at. My parents are in their 70s of interesting levels of health. I don't want them here when the party pops off. Unless they're able, and, and this between them and the Holy Spirit, unless they're absolutely able to be filled with spiritual gifts and to wreak havoc on all forms of enemy, praise God, I want them here. I want them on display. And, you know, the party's going to do what it does. But for the most part, for the people that can't physically go through what's coming and God has not appointed them or anointed them to physically with endure and withstand, I don't want them here for I don't want the people that I love here for it that don't have a dog in the fight. Man, he talks about pregnant and nursing mothers. Don't mm -hmm. You don't want it to be, be here through winter. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't see that being the case. But... Uh, yep. 
But no, the churches don't, they don't, they don't preach about spiritual warfare whatsoever. Uh, anytime I ever try to have a conversation with a fellow Christian about spiritual warfare, it turns out to be a taboo subject for them. Which, okay, so here's what's cool though, right? God accounts for everything. God circles wagons. And there was a reason why I avoided the front row like the plague. There's a reason why I was doing this before. Like my own father's pastor didn't teach me about this. My own pastor didn't teach me about this. Kind of brushes up against it. And they'll all mention Ephesian armor. But they mentioned tithing one out of every eight to ten sermons. They mentioned Ephesian armor, cliche, one out of every five or six. But they don't go into any detail. Like you're supposed to know what to do with the armor. And praise God for them. Like I don't knock again. I don't knock the pastors because, unfortunately, most people. Uh oh. We lost him. I guess. We forgot to charge his phone. Hey, uh, one thing I wanted to ask y'all. Maybe y'all could, uh, because he brought up he brought up the uh the talents. Uh, talking about the talents. Um, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, I thought that applied to just your entire life. Is that something that just applies to after or during tribulation? Because it, it seems that that's what the context that he's talking about here. I would think it's all day, every day. That's, that's what I was going to say. So, Stephen, can you hear me? Okay, so the uh, the talents, the uh, good, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm not sure if you heard my question, but uh, it's it seems to me that the con the context that you're talking about it is just during tribulation. So I I figured that was like a lifetime type of uh, context. Yeah, we're not getting audio. There we go. Never mind. I'm back. There we go. There we yeah. go. So the whole the whole point about well done, good and faithful servant. You're right. Is within a, a, a total you know, lifetime context, but here's a reality. And, and I'll even, I'll, I'll bring up Hibbs just to give him, you know, credit of this. Jack Hibbs said something about, you know, once the question of once saved, always saved. And his statement is, well, it's a flawed question. How about once saved, always saved, if saved? And so yeah. I that be, say that because if you actually were in fact saved, right, then the theory comes in that you won't lose your salvation. Yeah. Yet, Okay, so if you believe that you're saved, if you profess you're saved, you display the gifts, and you think, well done, good and faithful servant, applies to you, and then you, all of a sudden you step off the gas, you backslide, and you end up doing something that compromises you or goes to work for the other team. There are variables within that question of well done, good and faithful servant I can't account for. Because I, I know that my measure of well done, good and faithful servant, for me, as it relates to spiritual warfare, is on a daily basis. That's for me. I don't give myself room to, to step back or step off the gas. I don't do that because that's how God and I have worked out this whole measure of spiritual warfare. So I, I'm not saying that's the same for everyone because I believe the 1% that actually gets their hands dirty and does the fighting, I think we actually engage in these things differently. And so I can't say what well done, good and faithful servant is for you or for anyone uh. So it's like a, it's like salvation. It's it's between you and God. So it's the same, it's the same context. Like, okay, now that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. Like, like, like the same the same the same framework that might apply for God to tell me that doesn't apply for God to tell you that or somebody else. Like it's I, I believe it's entirely subjective to the individual the measure the the level of 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 how much that they've been you know predestined and chosen and called mm -hmm. to the measure of how much they actually follow through. That's why follow through is everything. That's why, you know, just being, just showing up for the party is one thing, but showing up with a full measure of how God intended for you, fearfully and wonderfully made, that's everything. You don't, and, you and don't that, tell the, you don't tell the cook and the, uh, the squad leader with the SA, SAW, the, the same good and faithful, hey, good job, dude. I mean, one cooks pancakes and the other one takes care of business. It's two different good jobs. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I get that it's, uh, that it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, relative. So, but, but, um, you know, I, I, to me, I think it's like, okay, uh, did you, did you make the most out of what I, what I gave you, the, the, the blessings that I gave you? 
is, is basically what it comes down to. I don't, I don't know if gifts, it's just the gifts that I gave. That that should be it because I think remember me talking about like how God is God is your greatest investor. He's your initial investor. God is your guy. And so you want to make sure that you are in good standing with God. You want to make sure that God is, you know, actively, you know, actively processing the investment and is getting a return. And you guys are co-laboring, co-partnering together. So whatever that measure is, absolutely. And so if some people are the loving hands and feet of Christ, and theirs is to nurture and love, then the whole world, all of creation is waiting for their nurture and love to come forward and represent God and be on full display because the world absolutely needs nurturing and loving the same way that the world needs fatherhood and men to step forward as fathers. So to all that sense, we have a pretty good, you know, individual calling as it would, would, would relate, but we also do have a corporate calling as to being, imagine the entirety of the body of Christ. Well done, good and faithful body of Christ doesn't say that, but that's what it implies. If all of us are striving for that level of spiritual excellence with the Holy Spirit individually, that's what we're on a collision course with. But it, it does take our pressing in. It does take us desiring those things and does take us being relentless in pursuit of those things. Otherwise, we miss the opportunity. I don't want to miss the opportunities. I very much think that God's statement of that has everything to do with the opportunities he presented in front of us. See, some people think that that statement just relates to sin and how well that you you handled your obedience. But even Jesus said, if you've done everything obediently, you have to say you've been profitable for nothing. Which means if you just do the bare minimum, that's not giving profit back to your investor. It's not profiting the kingdom of heaven, which means it's obedience and sacrifice and exploits and gifts. And I say all that to say, I don't want you to try and prove that to other people. That's something that just just is established between you and God. But at the very least, if you're pressing into the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to you know, bring you to a place that you're driving at. You're both on a collision course to be exactly what God needs you to be. Yeah, and the whole, uh, I guess the whole... Um, you know, uh, once saved, always saved. So the way that I have thought about it, or at least, or at least that, that I believe was, if if you fell away, then you, you were never saved in the, in the first place. Is that what you were saying? Or yes, that's that's, totally. that's what I was saying. Because like if 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 you, you know, it's it's the whole declaration thing that we talked about. You know, you raise your hand in church when everybody's got their heads bowed and their eyes closed, and then you repeat Romans. Uh, and, and then you make the declaration and that's all it is. And then you go back to being an atheist and you weren't actually sick. You know? So here's another perspective on that that I heard the other day. What what if, you know, it says that your faith can't be or your, your salvation can't be lost. But what if it can be given back? What if you can just reject it to the point where, you know, sure, we can we can sit here and we argue, you know, were you ever actually saved? But. Can, could you just give it back, like just completely step away from it? Is that well, that's the thing is, is it supposed to change you? It's supposed to, the Holy Spirit is supposed to transform you. Uh, what, what's it called? The, theosis? Is it called theosis where uh, you become more and more like God? Is anybody a proponent of theosis? No? I don't even know what it is. Okay. Well, theosis is basically like... Uh, it's where you know you're you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and and your goal is it's not a moral transformation. You you become more divine. You become more like Jesus, more like God, and and that's when you uh uh that's basically uh, uh it's a, it's a lifetime process, and so it's not something that you could just like deification type of process or just no, like not not being more being more Christ like. Be, be more Christ-like. It's it's not a moral transformation. Like oh, you just become a better person. You actually change. So, if if you are changing and growing closer to God, then then to me, they, there's no chance of you being able to fall away or or to give it back. I okay. So, so the way, I mean, there's what, a way that I what, see it. I mean, I could be wrong, but okay. But what? Okay, and this I guess this gets to my exchange, right? What if you exchange? Any thought or regard that you have 
for losing your salvation to just being completely filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, what if you no longer, from this moment forward, you said, I'm not going to worry about whether or not I'm saved. I'm going to be worried about whether or not I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit and I have evidence of the gifts. Right? You see how, like, the exchange happens? It's like the emphasis of your faith, the questions of your faith, because it's really exchanging a question for a statement. The question is, am I, am I really saved if once saved? Or the statement of, I will be known as a Christ follower by these gifts. I think the body of Christ is better off making the statement of faith versus hashing out the question of faith. Does that make sense? I, I, think, it does, yeah. I, I think like the, sitting there on the, on the, the salvation part, right? It's kind of like the Israelites wandering in the desert. Like we can sit here and we can debate about, am I saved? How do I, you know, how do I know I'm saved? Or we can just go, yeah, I'm, I'm saved. Now what? Now what's the next step? How how do I deepen my faith? How do I build my relationship with the Holy Spirit more? Like I'm not concerned about if, when, how, what. Like I'm just going to take the logic and the faith and separate it and move forward towards the faith. It's not I totally make agree. Level, level up. How high can you go? Exactly. Well, that's 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 the thing to me is like uh when you uh when you understand it and you get it and you continue to progress and, and grow, I just I don't think that there's a chance for you to to fall back. And there, would, y'all, would y'all agree or well I, I agree, but I also think that there's you know, we were talking about this several months ago, uh that there's no quote unquote finish line while you're still here on earth. It's not like, oh you're good, you can just coast now. You, you have this heart posture where you constantly seek more about our Lord and, and be more like him every day and in all of your works. You know, you just don't give up one day and be like, I'm, I'm good, fourth gear, it's cool, coast from here on out. You know, you have that heart posture that you don't go backwards. I'm wondering if this is, if this is relevant. What if... What if we navigate people away from these like lower level questions? They need to be asked, but at the same time, the redirect is you need to go to the Word of God, spend unheard time in the Word, go to the Holy Spirit in prayer through Jesus, pray yeah. for pray for right. If Bible says, if anyone asks for wisdom, ask for it in abundance; he'll give it to you. Do that, and then all of a sudden you redirect it. Say so. Exchange the doubt and the questions of faith for statements of faith. And the statement is: I'm on a collision course with who the Holy Spirit has designed me and created me to be, filled with all wonder-working power and authority in the name of Jesus. That becomes exchange. That's where you are more focused on remnant over rapture. That's where all of a sudden you have a dog in the fight, and whether or not God decides to take you home, praise God, you're home. But that's up to His choosing and His timing. And ours, you know, if His is the sovereignty. Ours is the opportunity. It's it's the responsibility and the opportunity. And I say responsibility this way. Listen, God's God's going to work his plan however he does, but we are still ultimately his plan A. God wants to work through people. God's assigned us here to be worked through as vessels. There's a plan and purpose for our life. And so God's looking at us with all the potentiality that we have of choosing the left path or the right path. And so we have the opportunity of pressing into, okay, God's is sovereignty, Ours is a responsibility. We ha- we serve with fear and trembling, hash our salvation, fear and trembling, and we keep pressing in and keep pressing in to the potential that we have in Christ. And dude, that's exactly what John's exactly what you guys what you're saying. If we're f- more focused on the potential, then we're not worried about the salvation. We're focused on everything that that pushing the ceiling of what we think is even possible in the natural, because we serve a supernatural God. And what's drastically missing for the body of Christ is supernatural faith and exploits. It's completely gone. Not completely, but for the most part. Like as soon as you step foot outside this country, it's there all day long. And I'm still hashing that one out. And I don't know if it's just a spiritual blindness. I don't know if it's a curse. I don't know if it's God's thumb saying like, no, I'm going to let you guys get as far as you want to before you guys actually repent. Again, I've, I've, if it wasn't for the fact that there were a handful of miracles I worked on U.S. soil versus outside the country, I almost look at it like it was either my unbelief or my faith that wasn't there that didn't cause every single miracle I tried to work to happen. One of them was 
this kid, man, this kid in your Belinda, a three-year-old kid, it was a friend of a friend that drowned in the back of his grandparents' pool. I, I told that story, I don't know, like a year ago. I, I, I prayed for this kid. I, just, I heard the story. My heart just instantly broke. I'm like, what the heck is going on? To where I, I make a three-hour drive out to Loma Linda Medical Center. And I'm praying for this kid I don't even know. I can't even get a hold of the parents, can't get into the room. And I start pacing and praying inside the little chapel. No one else comes in. And I start pleading with God. And all of a sudden, I just had this thing break after about an hour. I was in, so a three-hour drive, I'm praying, an hour there, I'm praying. And the Holy Spirit's like, I almost felt like God looked at me in the eye with this pissed off face saying like, what does this kid mean to you? Which is first off floored me. It showed me how much this kid mean to God. Like God, this kid, God loved this kid. And second, it showed me like how much we have even yet to contend with God over seeking miracles and wonder working power on earth. Like at that mm -hmm. point, I'm like, okay, you just called me on the mat to level the F up. That's exactly what I have to do. I was overwhelmed. And praise God, because that's that's something that I'll, I'll never forget. But I only say that because I found myself in a situ situation where I was deeply, desperately desiring a move of God to happen. I just I was a vessel. It wasn't for, you know, to tip my hat. And it wasn't any accolades. It was just I wanted to see God move. And I wanted to see this little boy brought back to life. I think I was there in the hour that they were doing the last test before they pulled the plug. And he did not pass the test. And they pulled the plug. And I drove away completely wrecked, spiritually just exhausted. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if this is what contending with God is, I need to get in shape. Like, I really need to get in shape. That was, um, is that four years ago? Maybe four years ago? Ish. Anyways. Contending with God. What, what exactly do you mean by that? Oh, wrestling. Absolutely wrestling. I'm, I'm going back and forth with the presence of God and the nature of God, where God says you'll be filled with all wonder-working power to raise the dead. And inside this hospital, I've got this, this pretty much lifeless child that's brain dead. And I'm praying to God that he bring him back. And God's like, what does he mean to you? I'm like, what does he mean to you? Like, you need more people here. You need more soldiers here, more warriors here. You want a family to sing your praise and to speak of your goodness and your graces and, and your mercy. I'm praying that other people will, will experience the full benefit of a miracle happening because we're giving God all the glory. And I'm going back and forth in prayer. And the presence, like the pushback I get isn't a demonic pushback. It's God saying, what does this kid mean to you? How much is this fight worth to you? How much are you willing to go to the mat? And, and all of a sudden, like, what other Bible verses do you have? What else are you going to stand on? Because God responds to his word being yes and amen. And I'm... And it's almost like God's looked at me like, who are you to even contend with me over this kid that's not even yours? And I presented my argument like, this is a kid that's within a family of faith that you've called into your body of Christ that needs and is desperately seeking a miracle to be done. So it's all hands on deck. That's what intercession is. And so God's already, God already had me on the path where I was interceding for years. But that's, that just means what I, I was trying to pray above my pay grade. I was pr trying to pray at Jesus's pay grade. Even to the extent where, if you look at the story of Lazarus, I don't know if most of you guys have gotten this, Jesus was pretty much pissed off that Lazarus died. Can you imagine that? Like, you're a friend of Jesus, you die, and he's mad at you? <laughs> like, what is that? What does that even mean? At that point, you're like, all right, this is really, it's like a fasted Christ I don't even understand. And when you cross that line, you're like, oh my gosh, he doesn't even want us to die. At least, maybe Lazarus didn't put up a fight. I don't know. I don't know how it goes, but does that make sense, Matt, about contending? Yeah, uh, it kind of uh, reminds me like, you know, people will often ask, atheists will often say this uh, arrogantly or ask the question arrogantly is, but there are there are Christian, uh, Christians who will, will ask it genuinely. Uh, why does God allow bad things to happen? The, 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 the one of the million dollar questions, but uh I know you're going to ask, ask that, and I'll give you the exact exact well, verse you respond with. You well, here's what, well, what, the way that I, I take a look at it is who are we to even ask? Like, yeah, you're upset that this bad thing has happened, but how upset do you think God is that it happened? You Maybe you lost a friend. Uh, maybe you lost a family member, and you're upset, and your entire family member is upset. Maybe something terrible happened to them. 
God knows every single depraved action that has ever happened throughout history, every single horrible thing that has ever happened in history. And you don't want to know what he has to deal with. You don't want to know what he has to totally. try to manage on, on a daily basis and the decisions that he has to make. It would break you to have to. So, to comprehend that, to like to, to, to be the perspective yeah. of a chair. Yeah. So, but, so, but you need you to be think armed you with feel the exact, bad. But be armed, be armed with this. We're, we talked about, right? Responding back to atheists, Isaiah 57 1. Just remember that, Isaiah 57 1. The righteous perishes and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. Yeah. God removes people from the chessboard because he knows that there's even greater evil to come and he doesn't want them to experience it. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Now there's, there's a lot of things like, Hey, uh, you, you're on the way to the, to the, your dream job interview. And then you get into a wreck. Now you're late. You can't make it there. You don't get your job. Maybe God could have saved you from something terrible happening. Maybe a bigger wreck where you killed a family or something. You, there's no there are things that we just we don't know. We just have to trust, and and we just don't we don't we can't comprehend the decisions that he has to make on a daily basis and totally the things that he sees and the things that he knows. It would just it would break us the horrible things that he knows. What, what's happening to his children? Well, and that's also faith, right? There's a comment from Kim Mers saying those moments we you know meant to pray for his will totally, but at that point it though it's. It's not just praying for it, but it's also the peace, knowing that God has factored everything into what was possible. As long as we prayed full of faith without unbelief and we did our part, the rest is on God. And we have to know that like God, this is the whole part about prayer. All prayer made in faith, absent any unbelief. You know that your prayer is waiting in a bowl of incense in heaven, waiting for God to answer it, which means... At any moment of his choosing, he dispatches warring angels. He exhausts heaven to accomplish whatever that prayer is because his word won't return void and his answers to the prayer of the faithful are yes and amen. And then let's take it from that point all the way to the very end where the saints are in heaven crying out for justice, which means they are dead by whatever means necessary and they're praying to God that he wreak havoc on those and just basically right all the wrongs. And we know that's what happens when Christ comes down for a thousand years. And at the end of a thousand years, Satan's break out of chains and Satan breaks out of his chains and that he's destroyed. So justice is coming. It's just not coming in the form that we expect it or the timing that, that we're hoping for. At that point, it's attributed unto us as to faith and whether or not we exercise it, that's totally up to us. And it, it's not always easy. Not by a long shot. How often do we? Uh, how often do we get caught up in waiting for you know that that prayer to be quantified, looking at it and, and waiting to see the results, rather than just knowing that it's done and moving on to the next assignment? That that's the heart posture, right? That's that's the heart that isn't fully yielded to God or the process. That's the heart that says, "Wait a second, God, you didn't come through," which actually becomes the main grievance that humans use to never pray above their pay grade again, to never like actually pray with faith. And that's, I, I think something that totally heart, like just breaks God's heart because God's like, that's it. Like you brushed up with like one, maybe two big prayers and didn't happen on your time frame, So you're done. Like that's all you got. Well, and sometimes I, I think it's, it's not even so much. It didn't happen on our time frame. It happened, but we weren't looking. We weren't, we were not looking for the happening and it happened anyways. And then it totally passed you by because you weren't looking for it because it wasn't exactly the way you dictated it. Totally. Even Gummo had, I think that's your brother. Like he said, like, you know, what's the meaning that our lives even have without the bad stuff to happen, right? Like both, both sides of the coin give so much perspective and it even adds, it even adds to the fact that, Everything's My gosh, on spectrum. Like, oh, well, because joy. So C.S. Lewis had this book called Surprised by Joy. If you haven't read it yet, you have to read it. But what it says is that imagine what would happen if we were just on this lifelong experience where all we did was experience joy, like an elation, like a drug, you know, a drug effect. What 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 good would heaven be? 
why would heaven even be a destination if we experience an abundance of joy here? It yeah. wouldn't be a, a, like we wouldn't even want to go. We'd be like, no, we want this too much. That's why when we get these little pressing, little fleeting moments of joy, we know that that's what heaven is. How much more then do we want to be in heaven with our father when when this whole thing you know, plays out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, funny quick story. You know, that he is my brother, and uh, man, we we had a rough life early on growing up. But man, my mom, she's a she's a warrior, and uh, I think even during uh, at one point she lived with a street preacher for a couple of years during that whole Jesus revolution hippie age. But uh, man, just growing up, like sometimes the church was our safe place, and we were on the run from this guy for a couple of years, and um, and we. We've seen it all. We've been fighters our whole life, but it, uh, you, you see the father was home and you see a lot of the things that, that come from that, but man, there's some good moms out there that, that can kind of fill in the gap. And I've got cousins, I've got a ton of family members that, you know, they don't know the Jesus that we know, but it's all because of my mom. Amen. Dude, if, if it wasn't for women, there wouldn't be a church like the last 50 years of the church, like men left the house of God, left the home, left the wife, left the kids stepped out first and then just abandoned it all together. So praise God for women. But that's yeah. why that's why fatherhood and fatherlessness, like we have to look at society like they are wayward children and men of God have to stand in the gap, correct society like kids, and then hope to God that we can correct the ship. But part of that is a perspective of remnant because remnant means we have skin in the game and we have to do everything that we can, exhaust every earthly and heavenly resource to make sure that we are part of the solution. And not just that, listen, as much as I joke around about watching Rome burn with Wi-Fi, right? Like this is like a dumpster fire. I'm still here. And the heart posture is still to get work done to make sure that, you know, I'm found worthy to God and I'm, I'm found of service to the kingdom of heaven. And I'm actually found guilty of being Christ-like, which means I'm going to do everything I can to be the loving hands and feet of Christ until the Holy Spirit removes the restrainer, and all of a sudden we turn into something else. That's the work. And if and that's the other part too. I'm wondering how much disassociative, you know, if you want to talk about cog cognitive dissonance, how much have the rapture cult taken people off of the chessboard that they're supposed to put more skin in the game and put more effort and work into addressing the things of this world when we say on earth as it is in heaven? It breeds complacency. The rapture cult, the rapture cult, then actually works against that prayer entirely. If you're praying on earth as is in heaven, and you know on earth there's heavenly engagement, there's skin in the game, there's activity, the rapture cult takes you out of a mindset of, of being engaged. It disengages you. Yep, it's the opposite side of the coin of the salvation conversation, isn't it? Like the salvation is the beginning, it's the past, it's the depression. The rapture is the anxiety, the future. The Holy Spirit is the present, the now. Amen. So, so almost like this, the rapture cult leaves you basking in, in questions of faith and disengagement. And, you know, to, to your, to your point as well, um, of earlier that you, you alluded to Stephen is the, uh, the way, the way that most preachers are, are preaching these days is it, it just seems like God is a genie that that's there to just grant their wishes and, you know, they're not. That's why they're not trying to stand into the gaps because they're 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 trying to fulfill their own selfish desires with God, and they're not willing to get uncomfortable. It takes getting uncomfortable. God expects us to get uncomfortable. Well, they're looking. They, at, they they're, skip they're looking, that part. Yeah, they're looking at God like a convenient, like a, like a vending machine. Like they yeah. put in, they put in a little bit of effort, and they get what they want out of it. And that's why I think they love the the preacher pre-trib rapture because i mean you got to think i mean from a from a carnal standpoint it's great you know hey we're gonna skip all the trouble you know we, we, we don't, we're, get, we're gonna we're gonna see you guys later we're gonna go up with jesus you know and it's like uh i mean i get it it's it's uh it's enticing but you know i, I think people want it more than they uh are willing to try to val or uh try to try to validate it or invalidate it, I guess. So then that begets the question aside, aside from us living our lives on display 
and like the group of us having this conversation, right? And I, I post up my cute little picture on YouTube and we got like 20 people watching live right now. We've got more people that'll watch afterwards, right? So they're looking at us hashing out this conversation. They're looking at us kind of throwing Hibs and Calvary Chapel and Greg Laurie under the bus as having a rapture, rapture cult without, without letting people address their, their heart posture before God directly because they're speaking like to a cumulative group, right? What's, what's the play? what what what's what's a key action item like how do people disengage from this right you're still going to go to church you you need to go to church the remnant comes from within the church the remnant comes from brushing up influencing the atmosphere to the point that the atmosphere no longer likes the remnant and kicks them out of church so knowing that like what what's what are the words of encouragement for the people to actually make statements of faith and abandon questions of faith and press in for their basically their heavenly assignment on earth I think we've already established the fact that the Bible has shown us that all of earth, all of creation is hoping and waiting eagerly to see us revealed. At that point, it's perspective. At that point, it's effort and work. But then what? What are we missing, if anything? Like, do, I think it's do, important, do, too, like, that, you know, most pastors and preachers, they, they come from society. They're people too. And they're, they're no different than any of us. And you know, sometimes God will use a couple of us or a few of us to, to have a little fun, maybe a little bit, um, very engaging, but maybe a little bit higher level conversation like this. And it might just spark that one, that one little light bulb in their, in their brain. They start having that conversation with God. Now it changes the whole congregation. I just saw the funniest comment. It's hilarious. Brenna, so many people tell me that they're Christians but do nothing. My response is like standing in a garage calling yourself a car doesn't make it so. <laughs> so, okay, so that means that we basically call them out. We call them out saying you have the statement of an identity of in Christ, yet you don't have, you don't show it. You don't have the actual fruit of being in Christ, like the gifts of it. If that's the case, what what's our baseline for calling it out? It has to be the Holy Spirit. Like we can't just start looking at people saying like, "Hey, you're not a Christian." You say you are, and maybe we pose it as a question and say like, "All right, form of godliness, but denying the power thereof." And that's what you're talking about. It is, but the other part is this. The other part is us. We have to look at these people like they fulfill prophecy. So I kind of asked on one hand a rhetorical question. I'm dead serious. If anyone has like legitimate constructive ideas as to how to engage this, all four. I think we've covered a bunch of them. But we have to look at it. So for those of us that know that we're already leaned in and pressed in to be remnant over rapture, we have to look at these people like they're here to fulfill prophecy. Remember the, the, the word of God says the Lord knows those that are his. God has, God has established people for wrath. He's prepared people for judgment. The Lord will send men as a ransom for you. Like you read these passages, you're like, well, who are these men? Aren't they Christian people? Like doesn't, doesn't God just send Christian people? No, God sends everything. Whatever God wants to send, use, do, God does it. Isaiah 45, God creates calamity. So for, for eyes wide open, we know that God, everything's on the table for God. The potential is there. We also have to look at it like we're looking at dead people walking. And praise God. We do what we can, while we can, when we can, as the Holy Spirit leads. We live it out, as Eddie's saying, outside of that, I don't want any of us to get locked up or tripped up on these people and the fact that they exist because they're always supposed to exist. Does that make sense? That's a hard one, by the way, because what I'm saying is you might have to look at your own family like you're, they're, they're fulfilling prophecy, like the dark, heavy hand of prophecy. You might have to look at your friends. As much as you've tried to reach out to your friends and convey a word and lead, they're, they're actually living out the dark, heavy hand of biblical prophecy. And you do that, and that's why all of us, I don't, I don't care who you are, get in the habit of not just speaking faith, life, and salvation through prayer over your people now, but even look to the future. God, I pray for future scenarios that you're able to send someone to sow a seed, to water seed, to, to harvest the field, that you're going to send someone, after the years and years of conversations and praying and toiling, you're going to send someone to bring these people across the finish line. You're going to exhaust heaven to make this happen. 
that's something that all of us should be in active prayer for, which means as you pray that, you don't have a heart to look back and wonder if God's going to make it happen. Yours is the work of faith. God's is everything else. If we overstep our lane and we start worrying and we pray and we leave something at Christ's feet and then we pick it up and try and take it away and keep working on it, I'm all about the fervent prayer, the righteous availeth much. It's Old Testament and New Testament. But what I'm saying is that some things we need to leave with God in order for us to be of use to the kingdom at a greater scale and move on to the next and move on to the next and move on to the next. We have to stay fluid and lockstep with the Holy Spirit. It's more important than anything, even, even than things that our own heart wants. You've had, uh, personally, I've had friends that I've had to walk away from uh, that I uh, you know, never wanted to, but I, I tried multiple times. And uh, you can't help when somebody rejects it. So uh, it just kind of is what it is. I mean, once once I let all my friends know that, hey, like, I'm, I'm a Christian, you'd be – Crazy how many people back off, back away from you. John, you made a private comment. Why don't you say it out loud? You embarrassed? Martindale. No, away. not not at all. I was just, uh, I, I didn't want to take away from the, the steam that was going on in the current conversation. <laughs> no, but you, so have, I, you, have a, you have a valid point. It's maturity, so, too. That's like a mature perspective. So Matt, my uh, my comment that I was I was sending to you, um, great example. About two three weeks ago, you know, we were affected by the hurricane down here, and um, just through the community coming together. And, and I don't know if you you missed our, our Thursday night a couple weeks ago. Um, we had a young lady here in our community that gave her life to God. Um, she's been just absent from from His presence. Um, you know, basically, I guess you could say cursing Him you know, asking all these questions like, why are you doing this to me? You know, I'm supposed to be your child and just having a real tough time of it. And she had prayed, you know, for the new job and she had prayed for the new car and she had prayed for the, the new apartment and she had prayed for all of these things. And before I get to, to what happened to her, my point to you is sometimes when we pray for things, the result of what we were looking for actually happens, but it doesn't happen the way we have it scripted. It happens the way how he has it scripted. And sure, yeah. we are so we are so blinded in how we want to control things that we miss the end product. And so for an, in, in her instance, she'd prayed for all these things and felt like God had just abandoned her. She didn't get the new job. She was denied this. Her, you know, she lost her car. Um, she lost the, the approval of the loan for this and that. She lost her new apartment. She lost all these things. And she comes here to our little island. She gets a job at our local bed and breakfast. And just through the, the community and people testifying about God working through their lives, she gave her life to Christ like two, three days later after the hurricane. But those prayers that she had prayed for God to give her and deliver her all these things had she been blinded or continually be blinded through all of this, she would have never seen her prayers answered, even though they weren't answered the way she dictated them. They were still answered and they were answered in the fact that she now has a trajectory completely changed on, you know, the path she was going on. Um, and she gave her life to Christ, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I hope that makes more sense. And in, in what we were talking about earlier on, on prayers and, and fruits of the prayers and, and uh, you know, seeing things come to light and, and we were on the whole topic of, you know, why God lets bad things happen and, and things like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, well, that's, I always, always like to, to point to Joseph because um, you know, th think about how Joseph would have felt his brother sold him and then he was sold in Egypt and it was a, a servant to a guy and, and that guy's wife accused him of trying to, to sleep with her. And then he gets thrown in prison for two years. Imagine he's sitting in prison, like what the hell, like God, where are you? And little does he know he goes from being the lowest of the low prison to being Pharaoh's second, the second most powerful man in, in Egypt. And, uh, you know, we, we often, uh, 
we don't sit there and think. We, we don't ever sit there and think about that. We have to con- uh, consciously remind ourselves. That's why I love that story so much is because that's one of the most comforting stories is because uh, you're going through the thick of it and you're like, you know, God, and, where and, are you? But he's, and remember, it mean he's not working. It doesn't mean. He's and not remember, in, in all things and all circumstances, through repetition, we are to give thanks. It doesn't say all in good things. It doesn't say when the sun's shining. Even when the, the proverbial fecal matter is hitting the oscillating rotating device, you you still give thanks. And you say, thank you, Father. I appreciate it. You know, when, when the tire gets flat on the car and you go, oh, man, I got a flat tire. You say, Father, I appreciate you Let me have the car. You know, uh, I appreciate you making me to, uh, late to work today. You have no idea from the 10,000 foot view what you were to encounter that day. And you just put a smile on your face and you say, Father, I appreciate it. Well, sometimes it's not even about, you know, what the effect is on your life. Maybe you're just a drop in the bucket for somebody else's. You're the seed that got planted. Yeah, absolutely. You are just part of the ripple, brother. Part of the ripple. Yeah. No, amen. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think one of the but one of the frustrating aspects for me personally is how people hold you to a cultural standard. And most people don't hold you to a biblical standard or a Christian standard, I guess you could call. And uh, you're holding yourself to a Christian standard, and that's not a cultural standard. And, uh, you know, and, and people are becoming, and you just can't explain that to people because they don't want to understand. And it's kind of like. For me, what you just said is you trying to explain your life to the world, and it will never work. Well, that's that's why it's it's working out our salvation with fear and trembling, and as long as we do that, like we're working out that salvation with God alone, people are going to see what they see. It's kind of like looking at other people, especially ones that reflect God, right? Let's say it's someone looking at pastors. Let's say it's someone online looking at me, like why is this guy saying what he's saying? If you look for people to see God, you'll never see God clearly. But if you look to God to see people, you'll see God and everything else exactly as you're supposed to. And Steve, if I can, if I can tie tie something in real quick, you had asked uh, a few minutes ago. You know how do we how do we call these people out who say they're Christians but they're not Christians? Did, did I hear that right earlier? A few minutes ago. Yep. So I don't I don't even think that's that's a verbal question to ask. I think, uh, Matt, you know, when you're talking about people seeing your life and, and asking you, you know, to, to basically tell them why you are who you are, don't do it. Let your actions speak louder than words. Let those works through faith that are not dead speak the volumes that they need to speak and let people just watch. And the same thing with the people that say, well, I'm a Christian and I do this and I do that. Okay, show it. Show me. Yeah. You know, hey, we need help down here and, and to do this and let the congregation see them back out. Well, I got poker at five and I've got, you know, a, a, a golf game. at you know, but no, let them see their works not produce fruit and they will do the talking for you. And it will be a nonverbal. Obviously, they're not who they say they are. Yeah, and I, I never try to explain myself to, to anyone. It's more of those. It's more of those, uh, like one of those, like it's where you walk, walk into like a situation and you just kind of know, like that's that's kind of the gist of it, and all you can do is just kind of shake your head. You know, nobody will understand. It's not even worth explaining it because, again, nobody will will understand. And and you you understand why people are doing something, but they don't understand why they're doing it. Or you could be like Paul Cap and uh, and Steve and just pull the pin and throw it in the middle and run. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and it gets back to my statement, right? I'm not trying to club baby seals. I'm never, never trying to beat someone over that. Like if, and, and here's why: I've had my moments and times of saying something stupid or not being completely on point with where you know my perspective is supposed to be, my words supposed to be. And so I praise God for His mercy because if it wasn't for that, I would have been a dead man a long time ago. Like I've said some stupid things in haste and immaturity, and. Praise God, because I'm still here, which means there's still work to do, which means as long as I'm buying gold re- refined in his fire, 
I like I like I say this. I don't want to make these videos for social media. I'd rather be out. The fact that God's even allowed me the resource to do that, the time and, and energy to do it. For the last three four months, I don't know how I've gone the way that I have. Like especially in New York, like I'm randomly like sleeping like three four hours a night. I say that because I'd rather us all be on display in a way that conveyed exactly what the mission was. But some of us still have to speak up. Faith still comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, which is why we're doing this, right? So we take the fact that we're on display, we're performing exploits, we're pressing into the Holy Spirit, we are reading the word, we're spending unhurried time in the word of God, we're desiring spiritual gifts, we're looking to God, we're contending, we're experiencing the natural, trying to pray down the supernatural, and we're always on the move. And then from time to time, we sprinkle in social media with our face and a message and something the Holy Spirit wants to say. And then you move on to the next and on to the next. That's what the cycle is. And that's the collision course that we're on. It's our end of the collision course. And God still holds the other end of the collision course. As we're doing this, as long as we're on display, as long as we're pressing in, and as long as we realize that this is it. Like once we die, we're in the nosebleeds. There's no prayer in heaven. There's no second chances. There's no yelling down and influencing human activity. There's just us up there wishing to God that we would have exhausted more of ourselves on this side of eternity to effectuate heaven on earth. Because why? Because we have kids here. We have grandkids here. We have friends here. We have community here. We have people we're going to leave behind that might have been better off by us playing a more vocal and present role in their lives as it relates to their faith. That's it. That's the work. And the, and the work is going to be exhaustive if you're doing it of your own effort, your own volition. And the Bible clearly says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Which means, if God wants us here, we have to just be focused on the Holy Spirit's infilling, more so than we're focused on the questions, more so than we're focused on rapture, more so than we're focused on anything else. Because if we do that, Dude, the world, the world is eagerly waiting for the Holy Spirit-filled body of Christ to emerge. We're just not there, which means, what, is it, what does that mean? We have so much more potential that we have yet to even live out. Praise God for that, because what that means is that if Christ is coming to a blameless and spotless bride, means that we will, that, that potential in us will absolutely be on display. And I pray that it's soon, very soon. You know, you, you bring that up and... Uh... So somebody somebody mentioned to me uh, it, was, it was one thing that I that I heard when I was looking into you know eschatology and all that. Uh, there are some people who say that the more of the Great Commission has to be fulfilled before Jesus can come, uh, which I don't know. Uh, that's why I was going to kind of ask y'all's opinion on that because you know it seems to me like it's just it's very polarized right now. I mean I, I know that y'all could probably look at what's modern day society and see that, you know, there's really dark. And then there's things like, you know, what happened in at Auburn university where hundreds of students just got baptized. I think it was like Wednesday night or, or, or Monday night or something like that. Uh, it's just two polar opposite things are happening. Uh, and it just continues to just pull from one side to the other. Um, and, and they talk about how the great commission is just supposed to be fulfilled more like you mentioned the whole spotless bride thing. Um, and so I was just wondering, like, what do y'all think about that theory? What the that hasn't all been sense. fulfilled yet? What's that? What what theory? That it hasn't all been fulfilled and more more needs to happen? Like it's uh, how should I say it? Uh like the great the great commission, um where more people are converted, it, it just there's a larger body of Christians. Like it has to be a significant amount of Christians, like true Christians. So like it doesn't, doesn't mean that it all couldn't happen in an instant, right? Like, like say some no, event happens, like some global event, and then everything that we're waiting for that, is, that needs to happen before the end could ha literally happen in just an instant. I think it kind of goes, goes it goes hand in hand kind of with like the rapture and the salvation thing again like at, at some point in time we have to be less worried about what the steps are what the plan you know this the third and fourth order effects of the plan are 
and and focus more on and this is me speaking mostly to myself of the own revelations that I've had recently be more focused on our daily you know relationship with the holy spirit and being connected to him so that he can guide our every path and every single step steve like our conversation today tile for tile totally that that i think is where the difference lies and then when you're able to do that when i'm in those moments then i get to see pieces of the other parts that i'm you know maybe concerned with or in the other side i realize that none of those things even mattered and i move past it I'll put it this way. I've said it before, and I, I still mean it. God isn't trying to win a popularity contest. He never was. God, like, this conversation that I've had with different pastor people, different people in, the, in, in interesting circles. Gospel according to Steve, I believe this life is a proving ground for loyalty, for honor, for faith, for discipline, for obedience, for all these things. The Lord knows those that are his. God is heartbroken that so many people have chosen to disregard his son. It's already been established. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. We will look down upon Satan. We will judge the angels. And God is God is going to use this area, right? This In this age, the Bible says that Christ is the king of this age and every age to come. That is biblical sci-fi. But when I think about it, as long as I know that I'm being of use here now and I'm pressing in here now and the, the work is the Holy Spirit here and now, it's all that matters. My job is to live to the measure of my potential that God placed inside of me. Outside of that, the, the work is to exchange my questions of faith for statements of faith. The process, the life that happens in between that, praise God for it, but... I, I need that childlike faith. I need the whole process to become childlike. I need I need the the ongoings to be childlike because I know the outcome has to be childlike, which means I need to curate my faith experience where my heart is is in such a place and my spiritual ears are in such a place because God's always talking. I just need to be in a place where I'm hearing God clearly, effectively, thoroughly, and frequently. As long as that's the case, the obedience is up to me. God's already given me the opportunity to hear and know what the work is to do. So my salvation compels me in fear and trembling and reverence for God to see it all the way through. That's it. That's, that's a simplified work of our faith. Is, isn't that funny? Like we, we go through life and we're building up knowledge for ourselves, and we're building up experience for ourselves, all to revert it back, surrender at Christ's feet and be as childlike as possible. It's the complete opposite of the mental human condition and the mental process. It's the complete opposite because the mental process says we have to attain and attain and attain and build and build in order for us to actually have things handled. And God's like, no, you're actually going to lose. Like who is least of you will be greatest in heaven. Yeah. It's wild. And what, but thank God for that. Right. Because it's so simple. A kid can understand it. Well, we just have we we just have the opportunity of hashing this stuff out, you know, amongst us because other people probably also have the same questions. Well, we have to make sure that we take that in a, in a context as well because uh, back in ancient Israel times, children were the bottom of the totem, totem pole. So I, I think it, it means it from a cultural context as, as well. Explain that. Cultural children? We need to be cultural children? No, the lowest, the lowest, uh, the lowest of you will be exalted. What would you say? I don't I know what verse it is, but how would you say it? Oh, the least of you will be the greatest in heaven. Yeah. Will be greatest in heaven. I, I think that what's, that's what that means is the low, the least of you in on a worldly, in a worldly context, a cultural context, because children were at the bottom. That's why when the children came up to Jesus, the the apostles rebuked them, and Jesus said, "No, bring them the here." Of he said, said the kingdom of heaven belongs to children. Yeah, yeah, because they were the lowest of the low, and in, in, uh, in, uh, the a cult, from a cultural standpoint, it's 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 part of it. But all right, so just think about it like this: it it's not just the cultural aspect; it's the purity aspect. Well, that too, the childlike faith that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah don't so dis don't disagree there at all. And and that's. 
what what's funny is god the older we get we're so unpure like we just get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier and yeah like uh uh, the head's brother saying innocence the purity the innocence the and just the simplicity of faith because kids here's a cool part especially if you have a good kid like you can have a disobedient child but for the most part if kids hear something from their parent especially loving father and mother they believe every single thing that you say. I mean, they might joke around and like be playful and be like, no. But it's it's but it's it's not naive. They're trusting. Trusting, it's, yeah. It's, well, I think it's, it's trusting. Like, you can go even a little deeper, I think, as well. And I'm what I'm what I mean is and I don't know how much this really matters, but if you think about it, you know, Adam and Eve had childlike faith. I would assume in the garden. I mean, that's kind of what God originally created people to be before that change. And they were never children. Right. So there's just something interesting about that whole concept and almost trying to get back to what God truly originally intended for fellowship, even though we know we, we, you know, we're, we're still, you know, we know where we stand currently, but it's interesting to think about that. So, you know, another, uh, Another thing is, uh, you know, pe- people think that the whole childlike thing, the whole whole childlike faith thing, is, uh, you know, being I- ignorant and 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 assuming without questioning. It doesn't mean not question. It doesn't, except uh, we, uh, of course, I need to set the context correctly there because you can ask something arrogantly or to question God, which is not what He wants us to do, but to get to know Him is what he wants us to do because kids are constantly asking questions. It doesn't mean don't ask questions. It means ask questions because how, how can we get to know God if we don't ask him questions? Ask questions, test the Holy spirit, resolve your faith, consider the cost. Yes. Like that's, that's all those things, but it just means that the outcome is one of purity of innocence where you haven't complicated the overall thought process and understanding of God. Because yeah. that's what happens. Humans complicate it. And if we complicate yeah. it, we're like, why are we doing this? You know, why, why, why is God doing this? All of a sudden you're asking all these questions where God's like, why are you even asking this question? Like, I thought we've resolved this. And so some people, again, some people don't like the nature of God. They've got church wounds. They've got all sorts of things that we're supposed to resolve and lay at Christ's feet. But because people have identified as a wound as part of their story they find it so difficult to resolve their questions of faith that they'll never come to statements of faith and they'll never understand that your statements of faith have to be broken down to the point that a child it literally becomes childlike where you have so much childlike love and and perspective of your heavenly father that you accept what he says and you just do it because that's what obedience comes down to it should be effortless like, think mm-hmm. about this. How much does God... Listen, I'm not going to try and personify God. I'm just going to say this. The Bible is full of references where God is not happy that the children of God can't seem to get their crap together, stay on target, stay in perspective, and they just they go for the balls, the asterisks. They, they go for all this other idolatry. They, go, they, they get manna from heaven, and they want meat. Because somehow the man isn't good enough. And it, God's like, how much more can I give you and I do for you? And you just have no regard. And because of that, God's looking at us. That's why when you see the phrases that God will not strive with man forever. A day into the Lord is a thousand years, is a thousand years unto a day. And we're at the end of six 6,000 years in six days. You get it. Like, I couldn't imagine being God and going another, you know, thousand years of this i couldn't i'd like the, the the we've reached the pinnacle of depravity the pinnacle of idolatry the pinnacle of heresy apostasy lethargy ap- like everything and we still somehow think that god isn't going to collect rent that the landlord is somehow absentee and will remain so and it's it's so disheartening and that's it's, it's the funny part. Like the more you engage in spiritual warfare, the more you hate the evil behind it, but you love the person 
and you're you're low key terrified for them that they can live in such blatant ongoing ignorance that they truly have no yeah. regard for the for the heavy hand of God that's coming that's <clears> always <throat> been there, but just His grace and mercy have abounded, and now we're we're at we're at this reality that yeah we we took it all for granted, and so rents due, and and quite soon I mean, my gosh look at the border look at everything else like oh mm -hmm. Steve question you know. I'm sorry, go ahead. Came, no, I just came kind of late. Sorry, guys. I was wondering, uh, I see the title, Remnant Over Rapture. Uh, did we discuss in this video, like, pre-trib, pre -trib, post-trib, mid-trib, and all of those different rapture views, or the no rapture, well, or is it rapture in general? We were more so talking about how church, like, uh, the whole pre-trib... They focus uh, too much on rapture? Yeah, they, they focus on that, <laughs> and... Uh, how people how, how people kind of just become complacent got it from it and and another thing that I was going to bring up as as well about it is uh like they also kind of look down on other people because they think that they it's it's it kind of breeds arrogance a little bit as well because they're like oh you know god is going to punish you uh and think that they're you know uh and it's it's kind of the same thing with the calvinist bunch uh the elect they think because they're the elect they Everyone else is going to get punished. It just kind of creates this arrogance, and I, I, I don't okay, know if so notice that as well. But for them to us, they look at us like we're arrogant because we think we're going to be around until Jesus returns. <laughs> like every everyone's got their their angle. Like listen, listen I love so much of what John MacArthur and Vody Bakum say, and then I'm just reviled at the fact that they completely disregard spiritual gifts. Like, the, yes. but they'll mention the Holy Spirit, but they'll disregard it. But, the, but again, I have to work out my salvation with fear and trembling as much as they do. I pray for them. I, they, they have some amazing points, theologically speaking. And then I just kind of look at them like, that sucks. Because I've clearly seen the work of God and the Holy Spirit on display. It would be so much cooler. And this, this is what's going to happen. As the future goes forward, if they're still around and they didn't get raptured up or they didn't die off because of some natural situation... How cool would it be if guys like that all of a sudden say like, okay, cool. You just proved by virtue of evidence of the Holy Spirit on display in your life with fit, with wonder working power that the Holy Spirit is alive and well. I want that. And all of a sudden they come to this side. Praise God. And that means that even spirit filled Christians can glean from Vody and from MacArthur and from other people that have sound perspective of doctrine or just even perspective on certain things. But again, it's like it's like eating fish. You eat the meat and you spit out the bones. If you know that your faith in God and your walk with the Holy Spirit is alive and well and full, where you are in a collision of spiritual wonder-working power and exploits, which is exactly as Jesus said, you will know my followers. Followers, not apostles, not just followers. People who say they follow Christ. You will know them by they will pray in other tongues, cast out devils, heal the sick, cleanse lepers, drink poison, handle snakes, and not die. That's amazing. And I pray to God that everyone that's within every circle of faith, as it relates to faith in Jesus Christ, absolutely come forward. I pray that their salvation get worked out to the point that they're filled with supernatural gifts. Why? Because I want more people rolling around with supernatural gifts. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. And so, so, Chuck, to answer your question, I, I took the nuance because it's been talked about and belaguered to death about pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, mid-rib, whatever. Like I just want to identify if you, if you, what your heart posture is. If you focus solely on a rapture over remnant perspective, mm. you're leaving out some of the coolest parts of the Bible and you might have inadvertently signed up to be part of a rapture cult. Yeah. I definitely been there, done that when I was in my Pentecostal years back in the day. You know, uh, you know, it was it was kind of <laughs> I was looking forward to it. Like, dude, I'm out of here, bro. Thank you, man. Uh, it's a good time, and it's gonna be bad for the whoever stays, right? But uh, you know, I had the the honor that on the show uh, I've had quite a bit of um, scholars and researchers talking about eschatology, and uh, well, there's one thing that they all agree on that once you start studying the book of revelation and the old testament everything that's used for eschatology and you look at it in the hebrew context right uh in the actual original language 
uh, it's actually it actually becomes more cryptic because prophecy is intended to be cryptic. It's intended for us to not fully understand. Mm. Um, uh, if it was fully understood, then of course Satan would have known that killing Jesus would have been the plan. So he didn't understand it. He didn't get it. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of that stuff that I feel that eschatology falls under there. But they all had one comment that I kind of stuck with my in my mind and in my heart that uh, how about we all work for the kingdom as if we knew he was coming back tomorrow. Right. And then that would probably kind of solve most of the problems. Like forget about what you think if it's pre-trib amazing. I would love to not be here during all the suffering and pain. You know, that'd be great. So, you know, if it's mid trib, uh, then okay, well just a little bit, but if it's post trip, man, that really sucks. But I guess, you know, you gotta be ready for whatever comes, but um, but yeah, that was like the biggest thing that they mentioned that I thought was a really good takeaway. It's like, it's it's honestly, if if you're honest with the language, it's pretty cryptic. You can't be final on anything. And these, I'm talking about Michael Heiser, the late Michael Heiser. I mean, he knew, you know, the Hebrew oh, yeah. language. He knew uh, these Semitic languages. He's an expert. That's what he does, you know. And uh, so he was like, no, man, that was his least favorite subject. And he knew the most about it because there was so much arguing and fighting about what it could be. And he's like, dude, that's just a waste of time. Let's, let's work, let's work for the kingdom. And one thing, one phrase he also said that sticks with me is uh, I like the phrases people say they really stick. And uh, he said, um, the kingdom is already, but not yet. So there's this kind of working out process. And every time, of course, someone gets saved, you're expanding the citizenship of God or the, sorry, the kingdom, uh, the citizenship of the people in the kingdom. And so that's really what we should be working on by consequence, the psychology, the, the, the spirituality of that is, 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 you know, things start changing because there's more people with a kingdom mindset. And, uh, you know, we can argue all day on all of these other things, but if it's not a salvific issue, I, I think it's a great waste of time to argue about it, especially, I mean, I've been in this weird fringy area. I mean, that's kind of been my calling, you know, fire theft radio. That is the, that's where I'm at, you know, and, and, and even me being in this world, it's kind of like, I really, I hold everything with an open hand and it's like, yeah, we'll see what happens, bro. Like, I don't know. I get a lot of messages from people telling me, no, it's going to go down this way. And the blue beam project's going to be a fake rapture and all of that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's definitely a possibility, but I don't know. You know, all of that stuff is, is, you know, we'll see. All I know is that if, you know, I don't, I wouldn't even care if it's the real or fake one. Because if it's the real one, then I'm not here, you know, then I don't know, just or maybe I am here. I don't know. I mean, like the, the view that you have, Steve, like some might go and some might say that was like uh, kind of like what? I'm like, all right. OK, yeah, no, that's okay. interesting. So, you know, but anyways, long story short, I guess I uh, overspoke. I've not been here. I'm just babbling now. But uh, but yeah, so that's that's for sure. I don't think we should really hold to a specific eschatology, but that's just my opinion. Though. I agree. I was hoping you were going to keep that one. <laughs> no, you you're you're definitely on a, on, on a roll there. You said an important word. You said expand. And, you know, what does a hollow point do? And we've got to let our hallelujahs be hollow, like hollow points and expand the kingdom. So mm -hmm. I pray to God, preachers and pastors like Jack Head, watch this and watch it to the, to the end. And, um, you know, there, I think there's people out here that are spiritual gifts that, you know, maybe we're, we're put here to speak to people like them. And uh, is there anything you know, any of you guys would say to those pastors or preachers that, you know, because there may be a word on here for them that it was you know, meant for them to hear tonight. So I'm just curious what, what mm. else would be. For me, it's it's pay attention to the lowly in your church because God's getting ready to use them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, and, uh, the whole, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's a message for pastors. I and and this is why again. I don't blame pastors for focusing on where they feel the Holy Spirit is leading them unless the Holy Spirit is not leading them and they're speaking from their own want. That's terrifying. Yeah. But I'm I'm almost I'm I'm giving them the pass and I'm giving them a pass for one gigantic reason. People want rapture. Same way that I give the politicians a pass. The politicians come from society and culture. We know society and culture <laughs> is is sideways. So for us to put politicians on a on on some sort of platform above us and say, well, you guys are more ethical and morally responsible and more dignified and honorable, they're not. They come from the environment and they act as if they are from that environment. We just have this weird perception. We want them to be better than us. 
And so if, if the majority of people within the body of Christ want rapture over remnant, I'm not mad at the pastor for peddling what they're doing. That's why, again, how many churches spoke up against Roe versus Wade or at least celebrated that Roe versus Wade was overturned? Very few. Oh. It's sad. Like the, like the numbers are coming across just by looking at the social media posts. And I, I remember like, Kyle, you were there. Like other people were there. We're walking and laying hands on the Supreme Court building back in 2020, 2021. And we're praying down these things. We're praying the fear of God in these places. And it's not to say, look at us. It's like, I just, I know that there's so many people praying and people might not like something in culture, but that doesn't mean that they're actively engaged against that thing in culture. However, Christians are called to not both not like it compared to what the Bible says, but also engage it first in prayer and then in person. And so as long as we are constantly engaging these things in the supernatural and we're pressing in for insight and revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit, that's where we need to be. So for pastors, it's pastors, if you've hung your hat on the fact that the Holy Spirit is no longer active and working and we're not to continue the book of Acts and it's just done in history, I hope to God you're going to jump off your pulpit very soon. No joke, because you are part of the problem and you are confirmation that God is not returning to a four-walled church. He's returning to people. That Jesus is coming back to people, not a four-walled church. And Ron, it's like you said, you know, we're being outworked by the enemy. Yeah. All day. 100%. All day. So we, we have, that means it's attributed unto us that have a heart for it as to honor. How do we honor God? God doesn't need anything from us. What does he want from us? Honor, loyalty, work. And it's not that we, and we're not trying to, there's no, you know, salvific work that, you know, we can, you can, you know, earn our way in. But because we are saved, we desire the work. And this, this society and culture that's dying around us, we have so many opportunities to put in the work and press in like never before ever. So praise God. It's uh, to answer your question. I think it's a, it's a difficult thing to talk to pastors. Sometimes uh, I I've been in many different churches for a while now, uh, ever since I left that Pentecostal world, I went, you know, looking for the evangelical church as well in general. Like I was at Calvary Chapel with Jack Hibbs. Was, I'm here in Southern California, so a lot of the Calvaries around here, uh, different things. But uh, the, as I got comfortable or they used me in the church you know, to be a leader of some sort or worship, whatever it is I ended up doing, uh, when these conversations come up about the rapture or things like that, for some reason, it's it's met with great resilience if it's not exactly what they're looking for so uh i mean it's not surprising to me but one of the first things i realized in my opinion that's not biblical was the pre-tribulation rapture um i asked the pastors like what's going on i even did one-on-ones and they're like maybe they don't like a public conversation about this let's do one-on-ones uh most of the time it was like well there's really nothing to see here citizen move along like it's like if it's not if it's not what we're talking about you know and that's kind of how it's been and i I've heard of many pastors that have changed their Prideful. their their ways uh, and eat to the point of losing almost their entire congregation, and that's actually more respectable because they changed the way uh, they preached to not be so mainstream, and it, they paid a heavy price for it for sure. I mean, they lost a lot of uh, faculty jobs and all of the things that maybe pastors are afraid of losing because now the church is a body that provides jobs as well it provides all these things and people live off the church and, and sometimes it's like well it's better to have a gigantic church so i can provide all of these jobs and it turns into more of an administrative issue or a thought instead of running a church or a body the body of christ and so there's so many nuances it could be pride yeah it could be all of these things but i guess ultimately it's it's their decision and you know god will deal with them appropriately and so it's a, i don't know but it is a difficult conversation it's hard to have these conversations with pastors I mean, anything that's not to be touched i remember having the pastors i mean the conversation is about uh what's up with giants <laughs> what's up with nephilim what's up with with aliens Taboo. you know what's up with uh, uh sleep paralysis and, and and demonic encounters and they're like whoa, 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 whoa well, we don't do that here so let's not talk about that and so and it's uh, I'm interested in, in seeing these conversations now that it's a mainstream conversation, the, the alien topic. 
I'm like, well, the church is kind of always kind of like, okay, now we need to talk about it. But I'm like, dude, we've been saying you need to talk about this because there's a lot of people in the fray, like in, the, in this gray area in your congregation that are have all of these great questions and they're never addressed. And I think they go to places like, you know, this uh, and, 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 and online to find better answers to difficult questions that are actually uh, really rooted in, in the Bible. But they're, they're afraid that it's not because they've never looked into it, you know, and, and, and any, any weird subject I've ever looked into ends up going back to the Bible anyways, no matter what it is. All of these weird conspiracies, everything is tied and can be related to what is going on with the spiritual cosmic geography in the Bible. So they shouldn't be afraid. Uh, and it doesn't even matter if there's no answers there. Then that means we just don't need to look at that thing that you don't have an answer to, or you just don't know. It's okay if you don't know. Uh, even me being in this world of like eight, eight years of podcasting now and all of this stuff, I, if they ask me a question, I don't know. I don't know, dude. Like that's a, We'll see what happens. It doesn't uh, derail me at all. Uh, it doesn't stop my faith because I don't have an answer. It's like they're afraid to look dumb or something if you don't have an answer. Of course, it's important to have information and get into the world of apologetics, but it's okay to say, hey, I don't know. We'll see. You know, like it's not a big deal, man. And so uh, I don't know. So it, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, <laughs> I feel like uh, we just got to stop being afraid of asking these kind of weird questions and 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 uh just see where it leads us but personally for me it's always led us back to the bible so amen i don't know if it's pride i i honestly i think more than anything else as as i've experienced it with these guys it's I, I'm, I'm gonna burst a lot of people's bubble the majority of pastors i know are not spiritual it's money that it's it's it's, it's, business. it's all money. Come on, it, but but it's it's not it's not all. Like I, I can't put but, it into. But a I, you're making financial decisions for your church, right? When you talk about congregants, and you, and you yeah. especially when you take money, unless you're doing it for free, boom. I think not if and not if they're the all evil. But what if are you they're choosing? In, you're choosing a love of money, or you're choosing a love of God, Kyle. But if they're insecure and ignorant, it's not pride, and it's not money. I'm not worried. About, it, insecurity is pride, though. Insecurity is not pride. Insecurity is I haven't had this symptom. out. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 a symptom of it. But when I say insecurity, it's that you haven't come to the conclusion of it. Maybe the prideful aspect of it is that you aren't leading, saying, "Hey, I haven't hashed this out." But it's not always money. Listen, I'm not saying that money isn't a condition within the church. It totally is. What I'm saying is, if we if we look to see the business, the business the 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 church industrial complex is absolutely alive and well. But what I'm specifically talking about is a church that's leading the majority of the people within their body towards the side of either rapture or remnant. And again, I'll, I'll even get back to this. So you say it's money. I think it's also the fact that I don't expect soft men to do hard things. A soft man that wants rapture, that's more physically, emotionally, spiritually inclined for rapture. I don't want that person to be here during remnant. I don't, I'll, I'll be totally honest. I, I, I believe that there are spiritual liabilities. I believe that there are people who I hope to God are out of the picture because their strength will never muster to the point that they are of use to the body of Christ during the actual tribulation. I'm so not saying that my bad family Christians. this when, when they argue, I say, you know, this is the kind of thing that get you killed in the end times. Yeah. Well, I mean, I uh, and you also, it, it COVID exposed a lot of the, a lot of them as well, because uh, they just, completely bent the knee without putting up any sort of resistance and whatnot uh, to, to mass shutting down or anything. Uh, and that's part of, well, actually, the reason why I left my church, I went to the second biggest church in the country. And I left because, you know, you were talking about Charlie Kirk earlier. Our pastor, our head pastor, liked a few of Charlie Kirk's posts on Instagram. And somebody saw that he liked it. <laughs> took screenshots, sent it to the to the news stations. It blew up, and then uh, BLM BLM was getting you know the, this was a summer of 2020, so Black Lives Matter was at the at its peak, and they came after him. And do he apologized like 20 times out 20 20 oh, times? Boy. And I was like, I am, I can't go to this church anymore. Like this, unbel I, I was disgusted by it, and I stopped yeah. going to church. <laughs> like it's 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 stuff like that. It's like you you. Jesus would have done that. 
Jesus wouldn't have apologized and bowed down. Like, it's just, he exposed himself. Yeah. Well, dude, Lighting. that's, we, we have the opportunity of defying any cultish behavior, any cultish perspective, any cultish programming. Remember, like, a cult becomes confined or restricted to a, a nature of thinking, speaking, or behaving, or in this case, anticipating. You're confined to it by virtue of conditioning. You are conditioned into this perspective that's that's not even so much narrow as much as it is not complete. It's incomplete. And so in this case, this particular cult, listen, I'm not saying the Branch Davidians, you know, even though, you know, David Koresh, right? The, one of the greatest Christian metal bands in history. Just saying, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> I'm just, I'm saying that there's more. I'm saying to want God and the Holy Spirit's move in your life more than you want to get a hall pass out of here. There's more. There's more word of God that confirms we serve the God of adventure. And if he didn't give Jesus a hall pass out, he loves us so much that he's equipped us to actually endure through whatever we consider a remnant situation would, would be called to endure. But we have to see ourselves valuing what God's actually done for us, what he's deposited, deposited within us, and what he's calling us to. If we don't value those things, we won't have a position. And, and that just, I, I guess part of it is, honestly, part of this whole discussion is, I don't want to grieve God's heart any more than we already have. And if there's a major swath of people that call themselves Christian and cry out to God and pray through Jesus, and I'm, I'm not saying they're not in the fold, but I'm just saying, like, how much more can they honor God than by saying, God, your will be done, not mine. Your want be done, not mine. Your remnant be done, not my rapture. That's the whole point of this conversation is to give people a framework of going to God on different terms explicitly for the purpose of submitting their will to his that's what we're doing that's that's what the whole idea of a ra of a remnant versus rapture is is that we're sub we're surrendering whatever it is that we want our posture we're building it up we're pressing in we're desiring spiritual gifts exploits everything but we're ultimately submitting it to god saying your will be done and if it's remnant praise god it's remnant if it's rapture praise god it's rapture i'm not gonna lie personally if i get to heaven and i'm raptured out i'm gonna look at god like but I can go back, right? Like I'm not done, done, right? And then what do I get to do? I get to press into you guys and rely on the fact that like, hey, I kept talking to these guys about bringing me back, about raising the dead, about spiritual exploits. I hope to God one of them is going to be pressing into the Holy Spirit. That way when I go down, one of you guys gets to bring me back. And someone out there might be saying, that's crazy. That's nuts. I believe in biblical sci-fi. I actually believe that the word of God is entirely true. All things are possible. For those that believe. So, so let me get this straight. You, you want me to conjure you back in some way? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Lay hands and raise the dead. <laughs> All right. It's, Any other thoughts? Closing it's rapid thoughts? Healing. It's rapid healing. <laughs> yes. Like Wolverine style. I'm in. Any other thoughts? I just love how on target all this is with my line of thinking to the point that I'm blown away every time we talk. And I, I can tell you that based on my life experience, my calling the last 10 years for the people out there that are listening and, and trying to wrap their head around what they're hearing, this is 100% on target tip of the tip of the spear, like it or not. Amen. You ready? Well, I know you had plans next week, uh, Steve, but don't you know that the rapture's on Friday? I mean, you, sh you should know that already by now. <laughs> now, I was kidding around with Steve, uh, but uh, me and Mav over there on Fire Theft, we think it's pretty funny that every year uh, they say the rapture's happening on the 22nd, 23rd, around this time, and they're kind of correlating it to a lot of weird things in movies or different like uh, astronomical events might happen. 
So in honor of that, uh, we're going to live stream <laughs> and see if we get raptured. That'd be great because everybody knows that things that are going to happen have to happen on Pacific time only. So it, ha it has to be <laughs> midnight. Ladies Pacific and gentlemen, time. Fire Theft yeah. Radio, Chuck and Mav are going live. We're Don't see if we get raptured. That'd be great. Yeah, I was like, all right, well, we got to take it away because we were wrong the whole time. No big deal. You know? We need, we need a team torn one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> we well, can't yeah. Get yeah. Get Maybe they can throw it in the halftime show this year. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, and you're going to love me for it, right? Because it's bringing Christmas into the rapture. It's beginning to look a lot like rapture. Like someone needs to make a, a little remake. <laughs> yeah, every year, man. Uh, but no, no final thoughts. Th thanks for, uh, for the invite always. And uh, I know I'm not here often or message often, but I do read the, the messages and i do pray for you guys by the way uh, uh i'm chuck if you guys don't know please pray for me i'm uh you know i always need prayer man i'm always going through a lot over here in southern california um so um but yeah uh, definitely praying for you guys as well so just so you guys know uh steven did in in uh inspire me to do a whole episode on prayer i did a prayer call a lot of people responded to it uh, mm -hmm. They've been sending me their prayer requests um, from all over the United States um, right now. So um, definitely uh, pray for me, pray for the show. And and uh, that's all I got to say, man. Well, how about this? How about you pray us out? Because that was fitting. Oh, awesome. All right, cool. Let's do this. Father, I thank you for this privilege for allowing me to be here, Lord Father, and allowing us to be here and, and uh, fellowship together and I actually think it's an honor to be able to exchange ideas, even if we're not fully in agreement, Lord. It's it's a good thing to have conversation and, and see how the body thinks, Lord Father. But I know that even if there are confusions among us or if there's doubts, Lord, that in the end, your will will be done. And we only I only ask, Lord Father, that you reveal to us, you show us what your will is and that you give us the strength, the wisdom and the discernment to see what it is, Lord Father. I know for myself, there are many times where I can see clearly what it is that you've called me to do, and sometimes I fail to do that, which you've called me to do, and I, and I just ask God that right now, as we pray together, there's more than two of us united, Lord. We pray that you give us the strength to do what it is you've called us to do. Uh, each, each individual here has a specific calling, and I don't know their lives. I don't know anything about them, Lord, but I know that if they're here, Lord, they are wanting to know and to do what your will is, Lord Father. So reveal that to us. Continue working in us and give us that strength, Lord. And if we are in the remnant, if we are there at the end in difficult times and we're mid-trip, post-trip, whatever it is, Lord, give us the strength to have uh, that ability to be useful even in the midst of persecution, Lord. And I take this opportunity to pray for what's happening in... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, what's happening in other countries, Lord Father, with uh, with Christians, Lord? I know I do. I did a post, and uh, it's gotten so much response, Lord. There's so much war, so much persecution happening in the Christian church, and it's never talked about, Lord Father. There's so much things that are happening. I think more than in, in history to the Christian body, and and it's completely suppressed, Lord. So we pray for those who are suffering in other countries, just because they aren't willing to give up their faith, Lord Father. When you give them strength, for they are already in the midst of death and persecution lord and they need your wisdom they need your strength they need your comfort lord father so please be with them lord father and so continue to work in us give us the strength lord and i i said everyone here and listening whether it's on the stream wherever it may be in your hands lord in jesus name i pray amen amen it was solid love that all right gentlemen so as always it's a pleasure hey one thing if if for some reason the comms do go down, I'll see you guys on the other side of Armageddon. All right. Yeah, right, here we go. That's a, that's a song. I know that song. <laughs>